Planning Committee. Some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses will be briefing us today via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their devices when they're not speaking. So moving on then to item number one, we have apologies from Gordon and I'm not aware of any other apologies. No, Chair, I haven't heard. Uh, Chair, uh, oh. yeah. I'll, I'll give him a wee late to the committee meeting today. Okay, thanks Christopher. Thank you. So moving on then to item number two, there is draft minutes from the meeting on the 24th of February at page four of your packs. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. Thank you. So moving on then to item number three, chair's business. There is correspondence from the speaker, Alex Maskey, MLA, at page 17 of your packs. Um, it's to highlight that a public petition entitled Extend the Covid Disruption Payment was laid in the Assembly on the 22nd of February by John O'Dowd MLA and this has been forwarded to the Minister and shared with the Committee for Information. So that's to note if members are content. Thank you. So moving on then, there is a clerk's memo at page four of your table papers. Um... And this was in relation to uh, a meeting, the informal meeting we had last Thursday with Speed Up Britain. There is papers from Speed Up Britain at page seven of your table papers. There, they briefed the committee on their campaign. Um, it was a very useful um, meeting. Um, they highlighted their, their progress on upgrading the systems in place um, that has impeded the electronic communications code. Um, it does not sufficiently enable access to upgrade infrastructure required. Um, the, the electronics communications code regulates the relationship between electronic communications network operators and the providers of sites to host the equipment needed for mobile networks. So the group is calling for the removal of financial disincentives to site providers to conclude renewal con agreements. Uh, to remove inconsistencies between legislative regimes, to ensure operators can use the ECC to upgrade existing sites, to clarify the ECC's intention for the sharing and upgrading of sites, and to give equal importance to the conclusion of new site and renewal agreements. Um, so, Peter, do you want to maybe reflect a wee bit of what they said? It was so the the code is currently out for consultation. Yes, chair. The the code uh, consultation finishes at the end of this month, uh, and essentially that's to try and close gaps and loopholes that there are in the code. Um, as as the group said, part of the the problem has been to upgrade to five G. A lot of infrastructure needs to be reworked, changed, and and members are probably aware that to get five G you also have to have 4G in the first place. So in some sites, that can involve an awful lot of work. What has been happening is a lot of those sites uh, are owned by various landowners, including farmers and so on, and they've been more reluctant to let them come in and do the upgrades. And the, the code consultation is basically, how do we get to close the loopholes there? How do we make it easier for them to roll out the, the um, 5G? But also, the group talked about how public-owned uh, property might be used more effectively, with councils, um, departments, arms length bodies, NDPBs, having such a big public estate, there's maybe potential there for um, putting new installations from scratch on those sites where it's not interfering with anyone's business or you know it's, it's not um, causing any damage or harm or whatever, and there isn't the same awkwardness about accessing the sites because often the sites are hard to access as well um, you're talking going across fields and so on and that can cause disruption and th there's generally um, a lot of not so much misinformation but lack of information for people about what 5G is and what it can do um, so th they were very keen to kind of raise the issues and also direct people towards the consultation so we have some actions um, yep. If members are, are, are agreeable. Okay, so the first one is to contact Scottish Futures Trust because they highlighted that they have been engaging with that uh, group in Scotland around um, this this campaign um, to seek some information on their work regarding the issues. 
to contact the department regarding its remit with respect to 5G and the upgrade to 5G, and to encourage stakeholders to respond to the DCMS consultation, and then to also write to councils to seek their views, because as members will all be aware, that will be a, an important piece of it. So are members content with those? Sorry, Chair, can I ask a question, please? Yes, yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Um, no, uh, just uh, there, you said um, they were keen to get the financial incentives uh, removed. Um, what, what are they? What specifically are they? It, it's trying to create a regime where people are incentivised to offer up sites or facilities to uh, host 5G facilities, but also people are incentivised to take 5G. So it's a bit like um, incentivisation there's been for rolls out of broadband or you know something like Project Stratum where public money has been involved. I think in this case they're looking for a better code or legislative structure. At the minute, um, th there's no certainty for the industry, so someone who's hosting a 4G installation won't necessarily be willing to have that upgraded to a 5G. So either they, they need to be incentivised to do that, or the companies need to be looking for other sites. If, if, members, um, if members are keen to go ahead with the um, sort of asking stakeholders, we'll get a lot more sort of in detail and feedback about that. Yeah, because it's well, I mean, it sounds interesting. Are they actually going to pay farmers to to go on their land? Yes, yes, um, they do. Yes, they do. They do. So they're they're they seeking right. um, the code to be a more, I guess, wall to wall, so that they can do that better. Because at the minute, right. the regime has a lot of loopholes in it where they can't necessarily incentivize in the directions or in the places they want to. So it's to create a much more complete system. So the consultation, as I say, runs to the end of the month. And that's why they're keen that we get stakeholders to look at it and that we talk to councils about you know, what sort of contacts they've had and whether or not um, they're aware of, of the potential of 5G and so on. I, I think it's important the committee doesn't become a cheerleader for 5G, but it's, it's really the committee finding out just what exactly the situation is and where the departmental and therefore the committee's remit extends to. Perfect, thank you. Okay, are members content then with those actions? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to our final uh, item under Chair's business, just to highlight that the debate relating to the economy skills strategy and economic output micro inquiry special report will take place on the 8th of March, so that's next Monday. Um, so the Minister and all members will receive an advanced copy of the report. And Chair, we'll, we'll put out specifics for the committee uh, in the next couple of days um, so that members have uh, all the information they might want for this. Okay, so moving on then to item number four, which is our briefing from Invest NI and Entertrade Ireland um, on EU exit and the protocol. So there is a clerk's memo at page 19 of your pack. There is a table with the baseline budget for Intertrade Ireland for the past five years at page 23 of your pack, and an article by Invest NI entitled Northern Ireland Market Access to Great Britain and the European Union at page 24 of your pack. There is an updated clerk's memo at page 10 of your table papers, um, an Invest NI briefing paper at page 15 of your table papers, and the Intertrade Ireland briefing paper at page 20 of your table papers. And just to remind members that Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland are the key agencies providing support to businesses to address the specific challenges that they currently face and enable them to capitalise on new opportunities and contribute to rebuilding of the economy. Both Invest and Intertrade have in place a number of Brexit related programmes that members will likely be familiar with. Um, and both have active communication campaigns on the support available. So if I could ask to bring into the spotlight, please, Margaret Herty, designated officer at Intertrade Ireland, Kerry Curran, who is the Assistant Director of Strategy and Policy at Intertrade Ireland, Kevin Holland, who is the CEO of Invest NI, and Donald Durkin, who is the Executive Director of Strategy at Invest NI. So if I hand over to yourselves, I'm not sure who's uh, making the first contribution, but if I hand over to yourselves um, to make an opening statement and then we will open it up to, to members. 
Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Perhaps I can um, can join first and uh, certainly appreciate the, the chance to talk to the committee again. I look forward to one day having a chance to um, to meet you live and have a, a kind of roundtable discussion. But if I can just take a few minutes to share where Invest Northern Ireland is in this tumultuous year, where in the last 12 months, the economy has obviously changed enormously and the lives of uh, people and employees and businesses has changed massively. We, we've been working on five key areas. Um, I would like to talk a bit around uh, emergency support and delivery of emergency schemes under COVID. Uh, I'd like to talk around some of the value for money recovery schemes that we're working on. Uh, I'd like to share a few items around um, European exit and how we've prepared businesses for that. A few words on the scope of um, continuity of economic development uh, and then some words on economic recovery. And I'll do all that in around uh, five minutes um, just to give some, some facts and some information. Uh, so firstly, just on um, delivering COVID schemes, we've, we've really redeployed an enormous part of our organization into delivering uh, the emergency cash schemes that the executive has commissioned this year. We've delivered five schemes now um, from the Micro Business Hardship Fund scheme, uh, coronavirus, uh, CRBSS, the newly self-employed schemes and the limited company director schemes. To date, we've paid out 76 million pounds worth of cash to businesses. It's been an enormous task to get it set up. We've had around 20,000 applications and made 11,200 payments. Um, but we do have a scheme which is effective now, delivering cash quickly to businesses, and then also um, um, doing that in a, a safe, protected way for government money. We've also been able to provide a good voice of support, I think, to many businesses and helping them to walk through the application process. And during that, we've trained around 120 of our staff um, to be able to dedicate themselves to these programs. So really a massive task, but I think we've made great progress with that. Second area of COVID schemes is we have designed a number of novel schemes, particularly for COVID recovery. Um, and thankfully, we've received funding for that from the, um, from the department and from uh, the executive. For those um, eight novel schemes, we've launched six of them so far. Um, we've had um, 700 plus uh, applications, so many of them were oversubscribed. Some have been paused and we'll be looking for more budget to complete those next year. Some of them are pilots this year and will expand next year. But we have around five and a half million pounds of um, funding that will go towards those in this year's budget and they will help businesses address many different issues, which I can expand on later if you are interested in that area. The third area is um, the European Union exit. And as you know, we've done a lot of preparation work over the previous three or four years, running NI Business Info as an information site, uh, running workshops with businesses, um, running webinars and sessions for businesses. We pivoted from before the new year to after the new year. And now we're moving from preparedness to how do you really handle the frictions and difficulties and how do you work your way through what is a first time import or first time export for many businesses. We've run 14 webinars now and had around one and a half thousand businesses participate. We've had 750 people attend one-to-one -one appointments. Businesses have moved from general information to really wanting to know what's in it for me. So we've been able to do one-to-one -one appointments uh, and we've run 11 advice clinics now, again, with 1,100 people. So in total, there's well over 5,000 businesses who've had direct interaction with us to help them figure out what's the best way to, um, to approach the, um, the changes in the trading environment. Uh, and we did stand up a live helpline from New Year's Eve onward, even over the holidays, so that businesses had someone to talk to if they needed to consult in that difficult period where the agreements were announced on uh, Christmas Eve, but they weren't all published and well known. So businesses were having to trade and export without a lot of the information they may need. So we did stand up a helpline for that. Uh, we've also been communicating, we've also been communicating, you know, how does, the, the, how does it work now for Northern Ireland in many of the interactions we have with companies around the world and with chambers of commerce around the world. So we have been working with global media and sector specific media to explain where is Northern Ireland in 2021. Uh, and I can expand on that later. The other two areas I want to then is 
for is on strategic economic development. We have this year issued around 67 million pounds worth of offers to over 2,000 businesses. And this is the type of project where businesses come to us with a project, want to do something to help grow their business or expand or bring new technology or employ people. And we work with them on business appraisal and then business implementation. So we've actually had a very strong year of that. Most of those projects are across the whole of Northern Ireland and the majority of them to small and mid-sized enterprises. Um, and we'll publish the results for that in, um, in May this year. We've also expanded the scope of our economic development to some of the new areas. We've been very active in city and growth deals. Um, so we, we're building an increasingly sized and expert team to help make those city and growth deals happen. And the more we do, I think the more opportunity we see there. So I'm very keen to, um, to talk about that. And Investor and I is very keen to make those growth deals bring something to the, um, to the economy. Uh, and then the final area, Chair, is you know, we're very focused um, in completing this year, but with four weeks to go as well, we want to make sure that we kick off the 21-22 business plan in a very kind of positive way. And what we've put together is very much a kind of sleeves rolled up plan for the coming 12 months. We have a strong pipeline of businesses um, with projects that they're interested to do. If we are able to support them, there's around 3,000 jobs and 400 million pounds of investment that comes into Northern Ireland. So there is a strong um, set of pipeline of projects uh, which are available at the moment. Uh, I shared previously some of the eight economic drivers that we're building into our plan for next year. I think it fits very well with the Minister's Recovery Action Plan that was launched um, a few weeks ago. And I think it fits very well with the programme for government. Um, you know, four, particularly four of the main priorities in the draft programme for government where I think we can really make a difference. Uh, so we are keen to you know, talk about it and to solicit the Economy Committee's support for some of the budgeting and funding things that we need. Uh, we're very keen for the Executive su to support the £290 million pounds that were in the Recovery Action Plan. For ourselves, we will live with the one-year budget for next year. I think we all have to do that. But we are keen to move to a multi-year budget environment um, so that we can work with businesses on multi-year projects, which are the kind of things that drive economic value and not always work on year by year. Uh, and we're very keen particularly that um, the future will provide some alternatives to the ERDF funding, particularly the grant for R&D, which we've discussed before. Losing that at the end of the last year has been a big barrier. We have found some short-term solutions for the coming 12 months, uh, but that is something clearly, clearly that needs to be addressed if we want Northern Ireland to compete globally because you need innovation, you need to do things differently in a significantly changed world. Uh, and we want to be part of that and at the heart of that um, driving economic um, recovery. So actually we start the year, actually quite, it's been a difficult last 12 months. We start this year actually very positive around some of the things that businesses want to do um, to create opportunity about out of the new um, business environment. I'm happy to share some of that with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Are you, are you want to go ahead, Margaret? Are you coming in now? Yes. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair and committee members. And can I thank you for the invitation to come along this morning? And as I said, I'm designated officer of Intertrade Ireland and I'm accompanied by my colleague, Kerry Curran, who's our Assistant Director of Strategy and Policy. If I could make um, some opening remarks. Um, Intertrade Ireland, as you're aware, is the cross-border trade and business development body. And our main objective as an organisation is to cr increase cross-border trade and economic cooperation for the firms of for the benefit of firms in both jurisdictions. In a Northern Ireland context, we help Northern Ireland firms take advantage of trade and business opportunities in the Republic of Ireland market. And a key priority for us at present is to help businesses continue to trade and export in these challenging times. We know that the cross-border market is a natural first export market for many small Northern Ireland businesses. And we know that businesses that export cross-border are generally more productive and more innovative and overall more successful. Cross-border trade in goods and services is of great value, not just at a firm level, but obviously overall to both economies and was in growth mode prior to the pandemic. 
the last official stats in, for trade and goods and services stood at over £6.5 billion pounds sterling in 2018, and £4.2 billion of that value was benefiting firms in Northern Ireland exporting north to south. Our trade programmes, Acumen, Elevate and Emerge, continue to support businesses to grow their cross-border sales at this current time. I don't think Kevin alluded to the difficult um, economic environment that businesses are currently experiencing, and that was borne out very much in our recent Business Monitor survey results. Some stark results, on average, 50% of the firms reporting that they're contracting, winding down or surviving at all costs in comparison to 13% this time last year. I think one of the, I suppose, the most stark stats was that only 40% of businesses are fully operational. Interestingly, 61% of businesses report COVID-19 as having the main impact on business operations, while just 5% say Brexit alone is having an impact. However, one third of firms say that both are playing a role in their current business concerns. So I suppose the pandemic remains the biggest concern for businesses at present, which is impacting significantly on demand, supply and cash flow. In addition to our full range of trade and innovation supports, we introduced a number of emergency COVID supports at the beginning of the pandemic. And this included our eMERGE programme that helped businesses to take their sales on their business presence online, many, in many cases for the first time. This has proven to be an incredibly successful and in great demand and continues to operate today. And businesses have been able to develop new routes to market, new channels to market, and many small and micro businesses sell in online for the first time. We also introduced our, our emergency business um, recovery support, which helped businesses deal with the very practical impact of the pandemic and um, dealing with HR issues, health and safety issues in terms of employees returning to work but also signposting to the many different government supports that were available also. In addition to the significant impact of COVID at present, many firms are having to adjust to the changes arising from the UK exit from the EU. Many Northern Ireland cross-border traders do have supply chains that extend into GB, and we support those businesses to understand the new procedures that they need to undertake. We have been proactively supporting businesses in the preparations for Brexit since the referendum result in 2016. We have engaged with and supported thousands of small businesses over the past four years. And we saw the results of this in the preparation figures for firms at the end of the transition period, with 45% of cross-border traders having a plan in place for Brexit compared to 25% of firms overall. Since the 1st of January, our Brexit advisory service, like Invest in I, we operated a service over the Christmas holiday period to deal with any emergency issues that, that businesses wanted support for. Our Brexit advisory service has been incredibly busy since the 1st of, of January. Um, our staff are dealing with direct inquiries. We have Brexit voucher. It's a £2,000 fully funded voucher where companies have access to expert service providers that can help them deal with very specific um, issues for their business, whether that's mapping supply chain, um, there's mapping their supply chain, understanding customs, VAT implications. It's really tailor-made support to the, for the very individual business needs. We also have very SME-friendly digital content that we're constantly updating We've had 16,000 users um, to that site, and we will continue to update that as, as the situation evolves. We have been engaging, likewise, work in partnership with Invest on many events. We held an event yesterday, an online event that was a joint event with HMRC and Irish Revenue, where over 500 businesses um, attended that event, albeit virtually, to understand what the, the information that they needed from both sides of the supply chain on VAT and, and customs. You know, challenges remain, and however, it is, early, it is still early days for firms adopting to such change. At present, our advisory service would report that SMEs are really overwhelmed trying to understand the detail of the changes 
and the high volume of information flowing out to them. I suppose it's important that we as an organisation don't um, stand still and we continue to offer and develop new interventions for businesses. Some of those include our trade information service that we are in the process of developing, which will signpost and, and assist businesses going forward to deal with any aspect of information that they need to know in terms of moving goods and services on a cross-border basis and a supply chain initiative that will support, I think, one thing that COVID and Brexit really, um, I suppose, brought home to all of us is the vulnerabilities within supply chains for small businesses and the need for those to, the need for small businesses to build robustness and more, I suppose, more um, professional management into their supply chains going forward. Um, to, if I can close by saying we, we work very closely in, in partnership with our DFE colleagues and indeed our Invest in I colleagues who are here this morning. I think both our organisations recognise the need for collaboration um, and have maximised our resources jointly to help businesses deal with the Brexit and, and, and the COVID um, pandemic. We also welcome the recently published economic recovery plan and very much um, look forward to playing our role in helping businesses adopt and upskill their way out of the current crisis. And I suppose to finish, like Kevin, to finish on a on a positive note, um, I think we're witnessing every day the resilience of firms, of businesses in Northern Ireland, and that's testament and borne out through the increase in demand for our um, products and our services, which really shows the fight back from, from business to trade their way out of the current um, pandemic. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you both for the, um, the opening comments and, and setting the scene for us and, and giving us the updates in relation to what has been um, continuing to, in terms of supporting businesses in relation to COVID and also responding um, since the end of the transition period at the, at the beginning of January. Um, I suppose, uh, first of all, I would have a, a question to you both about um, how or, or if um, what you do and how you deliver it it has changed or, or will need to change um, to respond to the, I suppose, both the, the challenges of um, EU exit, and you have outlined some of those, but also in terms of um, trying to take advantages of any of opportunities that there is there, um, because we have that the, the protections of the protocol, and, and uh, do you have that continued access to the, the, the EU single market? Um, and also coupled with that, then helping businesses hopefully move out of the, the current restrictions um, and into that post-pandemic period. Uh, thank you, Chair. Perhaps I can comment first. And um, so, so certainly we um, have gone through um, kind of very steep learning curve with businesses, you know, both for intertrade and for ourselves. Um, helping them, first of all, kind of understand what was in the documents and what was in the guidance that was issued during December. Because, I mean, really between between um, description in the in the documents of um, how will Northern Ireland and how will GB and Europe interact and implementation was really a very narrow window. So although the, the vote for Brexit was many years ago, and although the transition period was 11 months long, the actual window between this is what it's going to look like and then your first um, trade on the 1st of January was so short, actually, that I think for businesses it was, um, it was very difficult, and even for ourselves, just to try and amass the understanding of what needs to be done and what is the kind of real life going to be it was a really, really fast-paced um, exercise. Um, I think many, many companies in, in Northern Ireland, many companies in Britain, Many companies in Ireland have found themselves as a first-time importer or first-time exporter. Normally, we work with companies and try and encourage them to export, like we run a program for how do you export to Holland or how do you export to Asia, uh, and there's a whole training program that goes through that. In this case, you know, de facto companies had to adapt um, very quickly, and at the same time, we're all trying to do that remotely and virtually rather than being able to sit around the table and... Uh, and, and work through both the, the frictions and challenges as also start looking at some of the opportunities. I would say in the very first weeks, then 
th th there was very, very strong attention to things like haulage and you know documentation and um, what you need to do um, between Britain and Europe, um, kind of rules of origin. Um, you know how do things operate? So there was a really great thirst for information that we were we were trying to meet online and with these webinars and with these advice clinics. As we go through the next um, twelve months, I think there will be a much stronger focus on sector by sector activity. You know how do, what what are the things that sectors in Northern Ireland can do for the future? What are the things that businesses overseas could look to Northern Ireland to do effectively here? So, you know, I think that um, we've got through that initial challenge period of the first kind of few weeks. Uh, and then the next bit, I think, will be slightly calmer tempo um, to try and look forward to the future. At the same time, we're aware that some of the simplifications will expire, you know, whether that's meat into Northern Ireland or whether it's um, parcels into, into Northern Ireland. So, you know, the situate, the, the playing field does change as we go through the next few months. Um, but we will continue the conversations we're having with businesses overseas and here and try and help them to navigate a pathway through that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would concur with a lot of what Kevin has said. I think there's, you know, there is a role for us as agencies um, going forward to continue to um, put into SME friendly um, content and information to um, small businesses to get them through this very turbulent um, time of both the COVID and, and impl implications of COVID-19 and adjusting to the new um, trading environment. I think companies are and have um, because they've all had to move on online because um, channels to market closed down for many businesses you know, for example, food businesses selling into the food service or sort of restaurant market have to divert those new, new channels into selling into retail and various taking advantage of other opportunities. So I think it's incumbent on on all of us, and we're and we're proactively doing that, helping businesses to supporting them and helping them to get through this this environment. And um, we all, <clears throat> as organisations, went on online, so we made a. A sort of a, a quick dash in becoming digital um, uh, organizations and being able to deliver our services remotely and we have been helping businesses do that and I think we need to continue to um, help them to do that going forward. All right, th thanks for that. Um, can I just ask a question in relation to the support that there is for businesses with specific issues um, in relation to, to trade, whether it be East West or, or, or whatever, um, because, and, and I suppose actually specifically East West, because we have heard from um, departmental officials about this, and we have also heard, heard from some of the business representative organisations about it. Um, with the department, it was a case of referring businesses to TSS um, and HMRC. And from from the business rep's perspective, it was that that necess isn't necessarily as useful as what or as our businesses aren't getting necessarily what they need um, from that support. And I'm wondering what are either of your agencies able to do in terms of providing that type of support. And I know, for example, Invest has the the advice clinics um, and. We, you know, the department had says that they were referring people to those as well. Um, but in terms of a, like a one-stop shop uh, for, you know, um, guidance and specific support, um, like a like a helpline, I think was one of the things that business representatives were suggesting. Is that something that has been considered? Yeah, just, I'll, I'll give a comment. Maybe some others can add a few things. But um, I mean, in terms of like a, a one-stop shop for access to information, then we you know, we have tried to use NI Business Info to be a single source, and you can search pretty much anything on there. And what you can find is both the kind of the advice. So you, the webinars that we run, you can pick and play. So you can, if you want to get a general overview of how does customs work or how does the documentation work or how does VAT work, you can see the webinar that's been run by the experts uh, and identify where that is. And you'll also see the schedule for upcoming runs if there are subjects of interest in the future. 
Um, and then in terms of the kind of one-on-one -on -one advice, and I, I, re I recognize that this day two of some businesses want to talk to someone, then the, we are providing three lots of 20 minutes available to any business who wants to talk about what's in it for them. You know, we'll talk about what they need, not telling them what generally businesses need. So I think that's quite, quite invaluable. So we do provide advice, we do give signposting, and we do make available these individual one-on-one -on -one, um, clinics. And they have been well subscribed, and I would say that <clears throat> the feedback we've had from them has been generally over 95% satisfaction. So the people who go into our one-on-one -on -one advice clinics, we're getting 95%, 96%, 94% um, satisfaction rating. So I think people are finding the answers. I know there are some areas where there are no answers yet, like services and uh, how that will operate. Um, but where the information is there, we are able to provide it uh, or to sign both to PSS where there's a lot of people to answer. Um, sure, just to, to, just to add to that, um, slightly is um, in terms of MI Business Info, as Kevin said, we're, we're constantly updating the information. Um, since the new year, there's been 120 page updates. And in January alone, we had 29,000 page views. Um, so it has been very, very well uh, covered. Also, just in terms of specialist advice, as well as the one-to-one -one clinics, there's also opportunities for businesses to basically pick up with specialist advisors. We have a framework of specialists across all of those areas, um, VATs, tariffs, customs, um, transport, logistics, supply chain, similar to services offered by Margaret and Kerry and Intertrade. Um, so they're available also for businesses as well. Um, and as Kevin said, since January, these have tended to be on specific individual business issues that they want to uh, get advice and guidance on. So we're constantly changing um, the advice and service in order to make sure that it's relevant and up-to-date for businesses. Okay, thank you. Um, Margaret, were you wanting to come in? Chair, just again concurring with Donal and, and Kevin, we have um, a very SME-friendly um, digital content site and um, we're in from, you know, which, which is primarily focused on, on for cross-border traders. But obviously, companies do have who trade cross border also have you know supply chains that extend beyond that. So we have our one to one, um, our, we have a Brexit advisory service. Our staff deal with inquiries on a one to one basis where there's specialist um, advice required. We have our framework of of specialist advisors, be that um, VAT customs, um, etc. And, and businesses are wanting more one to one. Um, tailored advice, but that, that is very much available. We also signpost to TSS, HMRC, um, Invest in I indeed, and, and many other um, relevant sources. And I, I think sometimes that's what business need, the need that, that hand-holding um, advice, even if it's signposting them to the person that they need to speak to. Yeah, um, I think that that's it exactly. It is the case of um, the hand holding in some respects of you know somebody to listen to the concerns and to, to point them to where to go to um, and I, I guess it's in some places as well communicating the sources of the information so even signposting to the likes of yourselves um, and it's something that, that I guess that we as constituency MLAs um, also have a role in in terms of um, signposting people to get the, the relevant information and I uh, actually um, Kevin in your remarks there um, you you raised an issue that I wanted to ask about and that is in relation to services um, and uh, obviously not included in the protocol some um, so in some respects included in the in the TCA so I just wanted to get some understanding of what the impact is particularly for cross-border services so certainly there's some, you know, some still major um, clarifications needed in how services will operate. And I know there's been a number of um, requests made and expressed to the negotiating teams on things like how do you get mutual recognition of qualifications? That's a really important one. Um, clearly, there was a lot of um, requests for um, data adequacy and the ability to continue sharing data between Northern Ireland, Britain, and the European Union. That was permitted in the um, agreement that was issued on the um, on, on the 24th of December. So there is a, a window for continued exchange 
and a line of sight towards full adequacy, which should be achievable within the six month window for um, a continuity of exchange. So I think those things are, are real. But I mean, if you talk to financial services industry, whether it's City of London or elsewhere, then there's clearly a need for that whole services question to be addressed um, between European Union and UK as part of the negotiating teams for that. So, to be honest, though, I mean, and I, I've asked many of the professional services questions, are things working there? Are you having challenges invoicing or are, are things difficult at the moment? Uh, and I've asked that really to a lot because I, I thought there may be some great difficulties coming. But in, in practice, actually, people who are invoicing consultancy services or software support systems are, are actually transacting effectively as they were in October or, no, or November before the first of January of changeover period. So we so we know there's some clouds um, to come, but uh, in practice, it seems to be functioning fairly effectively at the moment. Yeah, and I guess it's one of those that may develop over time that we may see increased barriers over time. Um, and it's, I suppose trying to understand what those barriers might be, you know, if it would be access to the markets or, or what, what it actually would be. And it's just... Um, I'm not quite clear yet on where those challenges might actually arise, and I was just wondering if you had any any foresight in respect of that. Uh, I mean, I've been involved in discussions, but I don't have any kind of foresight of what the answer will be. I mean, I, I, I think people are aware that if, if you end up with the more that there could be divergence in the future between the way UK operates and European Union operates, and whether that's you know, state aid for services or, you know, financial transactions and how City of London works versus the, you know, the, the pool of funds that will be in the European Union. But the more there could be divergence, the more questions that will be raised. But neither side have really given the clarity that um, would, would, would help you project a pathway to what are the difficulties and when could they come. So I, I think that's still an open question rather than a um, impending conclusion to the discussions from their side, and, and we have asked recently, the, you know, is there does anyone anticipate when the date will be that the clarity will be there on the services? And I think from the negotiating teams down, there, there isn't a date that's been put in the public domain for that yet. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for that. I'm going to bring in some other members. I have some questions that I want to ask myself around COVID supports, but I'll, I'll come back in after I let members in for questions. Um, John Stewart, can we bring John into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear Folks, us? Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I can. Yeah, happy days. Um, Thanks very much, first of all, for your presentation so far, and can I thank each of you on behalf of the organisations just for the work that you've been doing throughout the pandemic, and particularly more recently as businesses are coming to terms with the new and difficult circumstances of the trading environment we've been forced into. Um, it is, as we see for many of them, very difficult, and my office and certainly my colleagues are dealing with many of the issues these businesses are facing on a daily basis. Um, the Chair touched on it um, in terms of logging these issues and trying to find solutions to them and there'd be signposting businesses and the great work that you're doing trying to resolve some of them or point them in the right direction um do you have concerns though that maybe a lot of these issues are being logged with trade bodies organizations like yourselves elected reps and everyone's running about trying to find solutions but nobody's actually catalog cataloging them logging them and pushing them forward towards the people that actually need to solve them I mean, do you see anywhere that these are all being logged centrally, whether that be by the Department of Economy? Um, and if that is the case, are they all being worked towards a solution? That's the first one. Yeah, and, and I, just to comment that, I mean, there are different working groups where I think there is actually, I think there's a fairly effective funnel of how to raise issues. Um, we can, some of them can be answered, but the ones which can't be answered, how do they go through to people who can? So there are, for example, a working group with Bayes, and both Intertrade Ireland and ourselves have got representatives in that. So yes, we, there is a communication mechanism and then it can work its way up to Westminster and the negotiating teams between the European Union and the UK. And there are kind of three of those working groups, whether it's free ports or uh, kind of bays. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's working out okay in terms of signaling issues. Just, just to add on that in terms of when we have a detailed contact management system, 
uh, within Invest in I. So every specific issue that is logged and raised by a company, we share those issues um, collectively with uh, BFA colleagues. And as Kim said, those issues are then passed up through into um, those people who are negotiating and making decisions. So, so they go as far as Whitehall in terms of representing what the specific issues are um, from uh, companies that we're in contact with. Yeah, and, yeah. We, have to, and we do work with different business groups and the advocacy bodies. So, for example, myself and Donald and some of our team joined a session with all of the kind of business bodies about two weeks ago, talking about Brexit, sharing what we're doing and listening to what they're doing. So uh, I think also on the outside of government um, groups, um, there is a lot of connection. I'm sure if I could carry. Thank you. Margaret, um, yeah, so, so really just to, to reiterate what, what uh, Kevin has said there in terms of being very well connected into uh, pathways for raising concerns, so both in terms of connecting into Bay's regional group, which feeds directly into what we're calling hot topic issues, so issues as they arise, and, and that's been fed by Bay's into a cabinet office group, very specifically for the Northern Ireland Protocol, so identifying the issues that we're experiencing here. In addition, we are feeding into the JCCC group, so we're actually engaging with issues with regard to customs procedure. So then regularly engaging with our colleagues at the Department for the Economy, so that any issues being raised with us uh, by SMEs that are experiencing any difficulties with regard to operations at the moment um, are being fed by DFE into Whitehall as well. So very well connected and lots of different mechanisms for us to feed that information through. Okay, thanks for that, Carrie. No, that's great to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit reassured by that, that you're in the that they all can't work. I mean, I think a lot of the big, big overarching issues are the ones well covered in the media, but it's the ones that affect individual businesses, of which there were hundreds of little, men, you know, little ones that you've never even have thought of, and they were the ones I was fearful that were perhaps missed out, but I, I seek some assurance from what you've, you've said today. Um, just moving on to another issue, and you touched on it um, in terms of um, uh, the support for businesses, and that's uh, around um, the, the ongoing grants. Just can we get, um, first of all, I want to put on record my thanks to the staff at Invest and I, um, and to Alan and the team there. I think they've been very helpful, um, way beyond the Call of Duty at times in terms of the hours that they're working and the feedback that they're given. And I just want to apologise for being so um, sometimes tenacious in my attempts to get answers to businesses, but you'll understand we are the front line and we're the ones who are getting the calls and the emails, as I know you were on a regular basis, but they were into the hundreds on some occasions and Alan was very responsive as with the team. Um, but just can we get some assurances that, that they'll continue to pay if you have that clarification beyond the 1st of March, should the extensions go that way? Um, and just are you prepared? I envisage a situation when certain sectors within subsectors will go back and others won't, and it will leave this really difficult to understand um, formula for which businesses are getting grants and which businesses are not. I'm just trying to predict ahead about how you think that's going to be managed. Yeah, thanks, John, and thank you for the feedback. And I know our team, you know, back in the virtual office, would be very pleased to hear that because they, you know, they have been working extraordinary hours and dealing with some very difficult um, conversations with businesses who have been um, going through difficulties. So, listen, we, we looked at the um, the pathway that was issued by the executive office yesterday to, you know, how do we come out of the restrictions? Uh, and we'll be listening very carefully this afternoon to the Chancellor and what will be extensions of furlough schemes and, um, you know, how, how will the UK plan its um, exit? I mean, it's clear that COVID is still going to be there, isn't it? I mean, it's not going to be the, the, the virus goes home at the end of the tax year and uh, we can all go back to normal life, unfortunately. So we recognise the schemes will have to move on. Um, we are delivering money at an increasing pace. The first scheme was really was very, very difficult to put together because we hadn't had that kind of digital application date, you know, review on an individual company by company for a KYC, you know, know your customer and requirements like that. So it was very difficult to get the first scheme up and running. Um, we learned a load through that, and I think we've got stronger and stronger at doing it. Some of the later schemes have become more difficult because they're targeting increasingly complex groups, people who weren't able to receive money in the initial schemes, which were quite clearly defined. So we were looking at 
groups who had been ineligible for LRSS, for example, um, so companies who'd been forced to close but were not eligible for LRSS, and that was quite complicated. And then we were trying to look at groups who were suppliers to the groups who'd been forced to close but were not eligible for uh, for LRSS, and and that did get that has got quite complex in terms of payments. The amount of processing time we need is enormous. For those 20,000 applications, I know that some of them we've had to have um, 12 phone calls or emails just to validate whether or not the application's got the evidence we need to be able to provide the government money. So that, that has been challenging. Um, and I would say also that the team retired, you know, they've been uh, doing this for nine months at a, a massive rhythm. So it is difficult but we will find a way to make sure that we release and pay you know, as quickly as we can because we recognize the importance of businesses getting the, the money that they need in, in these five emergency schemes. Okay, thanks for that, Kevin. Um, and again, just please do pass on my thanks to them. I know that there were difficulties and times where businesses were upset and I did my best to manage those expectations, but I appreciate what you're saying about the difficulty and the need for it. And I hope, to be honest, you never have to do it again because invest in how, you know, you have enough cut out doing your normal work, um, rather than regardless of having to be refocused to do grant work that you were never really designed to do. And the fact that you were able to adapt so quickly to do it. Um, I, I do take my hat off to the staff here working tirelessly behind the scenes. So thanks for that. Um, just one final point, and it's completely off on another subject for each of you is around um, work with local government and um, just in terms of maybe our enterprise agencies and other bodies to try and get um, and grow entrepreneurship on the back of both the combined impact of COVID and the impacts of Brexit. I'm just interested to hear what thoughts you have with trying to get new businesses up and running, perhaps people who've lost their jobs in the new self-employment schemes and what work they can do to encourage you know, and grow through, through um, schemes from yourselves. Yeah, so, so actually we're, when we look at our business planning for next year for 21-22, then entrepreneurship and commercialization is one of the key, uh, one, one of the key of the eight drivers that we put in place. Um, you know, I, I think there's some amazing, some amazing, there are some amazing entrepreneurs in, in Northern Ireland who've built big businesses, sometimes sold them on, the sold times kept on uh, growing them. Um, but I think it's in all of our interests to try and make the system a, a little bit better connected um, because we've got lots of great input, whether it's um, councils running the um, the go for it schemes, you know, part funded by ourselves, whether it's people like Catalyst, or um, I think tomorrow there's a session up in Derry on the um, kind of you know female entrepreneurs and um, kind of a webinar explaining to fe you know females how to access entrepreneurship support. So I think there's loads of really really interesting, but occasionally segregated or separate groups looking at entrepreneurship, you know, I would hope that as we go into our 21-22 plan, that we can really put some muscles behind how do we get that system to function as effectively as it can. And even in turn, I think we will look at how can we perhaps um, consolidate it in a better way so that anyone who's got great, great ideas can access the kind of business expertise that can help you take a great idea forward. Uh, and then as you come to bring a business idea to fruition, you know, can you access the type of funding that you will need to be able to do that, whether it's loan funds or equity funds. So I think getting that entrepreneurship system working well will be kind of really important. And I think actually, because we've all gone digital, in some ways, it's, it's quicker to launch companies now, actually. So I, I think we should really stimulate and foster that spirit. And some will be brilliantly successful, and some will be medium, and some will fail, and then the entrepreneur will start again. But if we can get a lot more of that spirit and approach and build the skills for entrepreneurship here, then I think Northern Ireland can you know, move into economic recovery a lot quicker. So we're, we're very keen to be at the heart of that. And we do have some plans for how we can do things a bit differently next year. And, and John, just in addition to that, Michael McClellan, who is the newest chief executive of Enterprise Northern Ireland, sits on our board um, and also sits on our sub-regional board as well. So very active in terms of engaging in conversations on how we support um, small and micro businesses as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, folks, I could ask 10 more questions, but I know everyone else behind me is chopping it a bit to get to get asking there. So, Margaret Kerry, um, Kevin Donald, thanks you for your time, and we'll catch up again soon. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, John. Can we bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Oh, Stuart, you're on mute still, I think. Thank you. 
Stuart, you've muted again. Um, thank you, Stuart. Um, I, I find that quite a um, little bit difficult in terms of sound. Maybe that was just me, but if I can just make sure I, your, your question was um, regarding um, uh, EU exit and um, that you recognise the problem solving, but you're asking around, have we had an uplift in inquiries for dual access? What support do we provide? Uh, what work have we done to highlight the NI advantages and how have we planned information sessions across the world? I think that's what I heard. It was a bit tricky. Okay, so hopefully that's the that's the questions I'm answering anyway, Stuart. So uh, um, hopefully those are the ones you said. Listen, um, we have had um, a lot of interest um, from businesses um, looking at um, 2021 and what happens next. And in some ways, we don't differentiate between what's COVID driven and what's digital transformation driven and what's European Union exit driven and what is dual market access driven because whatever reason businesses have to come and talk to us we'll talk to them and you know, we want to have a welcoming business environment as we do in northern ireland for companies to come here with people with technology with investment with manufacturing with supply chain so you know, we do we really, really do welcome um, businesses to come and talk to us what we've seen in the last months is that many businesses all over the world are really really looking at how do they want to operate 2021 forward and that has been, I would say, first has been driven by COVID. COVID's a, a, a bigger driver because it's happening globally. And with COVID, businesses have seen that supply chains are fragmented. If everything you get is from 7,000 miles away and there are blocks in travel, or then, then you can face local supply chain challenges. So a lot of companies have been looking at how can they do things differently. Uh, Normal is a very interesting and attractive destination for many of those companies because we've got good talent for a fairly low cost of operation but people like living here because the quality of life is very high we've got some world-class um, technology and we do have a welcoming business environment uk rule of law for business low corporate taxation so that you know, we've got a long list of reasons why um, businesses um, should come here and whatever the reason that businesses have to hear about northern ireland right now that's usually the conversation that we've been entering into. You know, what, these, these are the things that Northern Ireland brings uh, as an advantage. So we do talk to them around the fact that um, you can access Europe and you can access um, Britain um, from Northern Ireland, which is something you could do from all, all of Europe um, until a few weeks ago. But equally, a lot of the conversation is around some of those core strengths which Northern Ireland has had for a number of years and which will um, maintain. 
Uh, in, in terms of support, then we, we, we have um, teams based around the world, so we are able to engage locally. So, you know, so anywhere in the world, we've, we've got 65 people based outside of Northern Ireland, uh, and we are able to hook people up with a local connection, to understand the local context in different countries as well as the context here. So you can have conversations there. Uh, and then we do have an investment team in Northern Ireland dedicated to bringing companies in, as well as we have people who will work with expansion opportunities for foreign businesses who've already made their first investment here, but who are looking at expanding their investments in Northern Ireland. Uh, and actually in that area, we've been very successful because I think it's over 70% of businesses who've invested here once will invest uh, again. It's, it's warbling. Uh, uh, apologies. Um, obviously, some cases don't have as good broadband as others in Northern Ireland. I'll leave it there. If you're having difficulties with sound, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, thanks, Stuart. And, and we can make out most of what you say, it just as a wee bit wobbly. Um, can we bring in John O'Dowd, please? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to both Invest and I and Intertrade Ireland for the presentations and answers thus far. Uh, I just want to follow up on what Stuart was asking about, and in terms of your response, Kevin, it came across to me that you are waiting on companies coming to you to speak about the potential advantages there are in our current situation, and I accept there's difficulties for companies as well, and, and there's been quite rightly questions and around that. But does Invest NI and indeed uh, does Intertrade Ireland have a proactive strategy to go out and get businesses interested in here so we can create jobs and prosperity for the people we serve in terms yeah. of the current protocol? So, so listen, uh, John, for sure we are proactive. And, you know, for me, I, I, I really believe that 2021 is a defining year in, um, in Northern Ireland's future because the world changed so much in the previous 12 months. I mean, every global supply chain, every business looking at its global footprint, that I think that you, we need to get out and talk to people early. And from my mind, because there's been a, a spotlight of attention on this region, in some ways we get more attention, we get ears who will listen to us in a way that in the normal course of a year, companies or countries may not. So we have been very proactive um, in terms of communicating to business groups and to um, sector specific journal publications over the last um, few months. And for myself, I could tell you, I mean, I, I, I booked the media in the US to start doing breakfast telly on businesses for 2021. We, we booked it in December, even before we knew what the final agreements would say, because we have to make uh, Northern Ireland work in 2021. And making it work means talking externally and explaining what are the benefits of being here. Uh, and certainly we've been very active in that in the, in the first two months of this year, and we will continue to do that. We are more hampered by the inability to travel than we are by anything else at the moment. And particularly for sealing deals, it's quite hard when you can't fly in the senior people to be able to convert a nice idea into something where you can really show on the ground the councils and the elected um, politicians and the local businesses. That's probably been a, a bigger barrier. And we've been trying to deal with that by setting up virtual visits uh, to Northern Ireland. And we've done a, a number of those already this year. So no, we're, we're certainly being uh, proactive, not passive in that. Uh, and I, you know, I would love to be more and more active as we go through this year and as the restrictions release as well. If um, if I could come in there, um, and likewise, I would like to say we are being proactive in helping businesses um, secure opportunities in, in the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland firms secure opportunities in, in the Republic of Ireland market. 
we have, as I said earlier, John, cross-border trade was growing um, year on year prior to the pandemic and, and we see um, opportunities for continued growth. We don't believe the cross-border trade ever reached its full potential. So we have proactively, um, we have meet the buyer events <clears throat> for companies who wish to, where we identify opportunities in, in the public procurement market, in, in the ROI market, in various um, B2B markets. So we're continuously supporting businesses and businesses are continuing to take advantage of those opportunities. Okay, thank you. Uh, on another point, I note both Invest in I and Interfaith Ireland um, mentioned the economic recovery plan and the two hundred and eighty million pound investment that was sought to go along with that. One were you involved in discussions around the makeup of that plan? And two, did the department ask you to lobby the committee on their behalf in relation to the two hundred and ninety million pounds? <laughs> so yes, we were involved in the plan, and you know part of the funding, and the reason I mention it is because part of the funding of the two hundred ninety million will be for us to deliver um, outputs and outcomes in Northern Ireland, particularly on innovation and skills. So my interest in mentioning it is so that we can have an impact on the economy next year, not because we've been asked to do that. Now, we have shared um, and given input into the recovery planning for more than six months, actually. Um, and I think even in the economy committee in September, October, I shared the eight drivers and some of the things we're looking at. We certainly shared that with the department. Uh, we've got on a kind of granular level, some of the actions that we can do underneath that. And you know, sometimes we suggest them and they're in the uh, department's plan. Sometimes the, de the department suggests things and we adopt them. So there's a very fluid interchange between us in terms of planning. And particularly for innovation and skills, um, if, if that if that um, recovery plan is funded, then you know, we'll be very active using that for the benefit of businesses across Northern Ireland. Yes, but did the department ask you to specifically raise it with the committee? No. Okay. And I, I could say um, likewise there, John, we certainly weren't asked. I, I was bring Kerry in because I know she's been proactively involved in, in feeding into the plan you want yeah. to add to that, Kerry? Yes, thanks, Margaret. So, yes, John, we've been involved with the development of the economic recovery plan from the very beginning, much as Invest and I ha have, have been, um, taking it through its various iterations and ensuring that certainly the supports for cross border traders here uh, are well represented across the, the different um, elements of the plan in terms of trade supports and innovation supports. And uh, we're I suppose because we have been involved from the very beginning in the plan, we, we see it as being a, a really good mechanism that pulls together all of the supports that are available here in Northern Ireland, um, but also gives them that, that focus really on what we're going to be doing now over this next period of time to, to make a difference what we already need. Uh, and, and no, there's been no lobbying to, to, to us, certainly as an organisation, uh, by the department or the minister um, to raise it here today. But obviously, it's a really important part of how we're going to be delivering um, our activities moving forward. And so uh, it, it's important that we discuss it. Okay, well, I welcome the fact that you have been involved in the development of the plan. I don't think the executive was involved in the development of the plan. It might have been better if it had to be an executive document. I think that would have given it more weight. But just a final question to Interstate Ireland. There's been some questions at the committee in relation to your budget as we move forward into the next financial year as to whether it's a flat budget or there has been cuts to your budget. Do you want to make any comments in relation to your budget for the incoming year? Um, I think we, we responded to a letter from the um, committee, John, asking about our 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 core funding um, from from is is based on two thousand and sixteen baseline um, levels from from DFE, and we have been our budget has increased over the last three years, and we've been managing that through in year bids and additional funding that we have received from the EU Exit Fund and for 
um, COVID support. So I think Kevin alluded to, I think we're all operating on sort of one year um, budget um, budget scenarios at, at the moment. And, and hopefully as we move forward, we can move into multi-year um, plans. Um, but that is, was that, that's the, the, the situation that we're operating in at, at present. Yeah, I think, uh, if, well, you probably didn't listen to the budget debate in the, in the Assembly yesterday because much of it wasn't worth listening to. But that's another matter. <laughs> but we all want to move towards multi-year planning. But it's not sustainable. An economic development body, uh, it's, it's not sustainable, surely, to rely on 10-year bids in terms of a programme for work. It's much Surely we should have a baseline which is sustainable moving forward. Um, I wouldn't possibly disagree <laughs> um, with that. Um, we, um, you know, we, we, we are we're a small, we're flexible organisation. So luckily, we can, um, you know, we, we can adopt and, and move quite um, quickly and and agilely. But yes, for for medium to long term planning, it is. Um, it would it, w- it would be better to um, be on a, a more sound footing um, financially wise and to manage demand. There is great demand for our services, which is very encouraging at the moment, and we are managing uh, managing that, and and will continue to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, John. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning, all. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, um, everybody, for your briefing this morning. Um, it's been really helpful and um, an enormous gratitude to Invest NI because you've had a, a really um, very difficult job in, in the last 12 months rolling out some of these major support packages, and um, they've been very welcome when received. And I know you've taken a, a lot of flack as well because of, of, of some of the stalls along the way. But um, I have a great appreciation for the work that you have and your team has done. And I know that um, both organisations, Intertrade Ireland and, and Invest, are under a lot of pressure uh, facing into both COVID and uh, Brexit. So uh, to your team, uh, a big thank you and a great appreciation. Um, it's. I, I just. I want to say as well. It's great to have organisations here briefing together uh, the committee because I think that partnership and cooperation between both bodies. I get a real feeling today that you're working in tandem, uh, and that's that's really really good because um, there has been times in the past that that actually hasn't happened. Uh, and I just uh, I welcome that too, and, uh, and that's good. I keep doing that because um, we're all one team, really. Aren't we? So the other the thing I would probably ask is just on that cooperation and um, working together is for for Beth particularly. Have you got a good relationship with the IDA and um, the UK? Um, Department of, of International Trade because it, we are in a different place now or our, um, our, our unique position within the, 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 the uh, protocol really involves we really have a, a, a real deep uh, relationship with the IDA and with uh, UK DIT. So I think that that's important that that four bodies need to work together uh, in order to maximise any opportunities. Uh, and you both organisations will know that my colleague uh, Matthew Till and myself wrote to you um, probably towards the end of January, just to ensure that we were looking at an economic strategy and developing an investment strategy that um, actually put forward the opportunities of um, having access, unfettered access to European and UK markets. And I just want to know what progress that you have have made in this, because I'm really concerned that UK DIT are actually referring uh, businesses that want to have access to EU markets to other countries instead of looking towards Northern Ireland as a place that they should be actually signposting. 
uh, and again, um, it's so important for Interfaith Ireland to have that strong relationship with the IDA, particularly in relation to those supply chains. And, and I'm really delighted to hear Margaret talking about the supply chains and building in robust uh, and professional um, relationships for businesses with the supply chains. But certainly, um, it would be great to see that expansion of supply chains within the context of the whole island market. And we can do that both ways. Um, so getting referrals from IDA up here into Northern Ireland and, and, and have a very reciprocal, very um, stimulus uh, for, for the Northern Ireland, uh, for the Northern Ireland uh, economy. So I, I'm kind of knitting all of those questions to both of these images. So it really is about how are we maximizing opportunities in order to grow uh, the, the Northern Ireland economy. Okay, thank you, Sinead. I will um, have a go answering them, all of those questions knitted together. Uh, so the first thing, if I can start with DIT. We, we work really closely with DIT, actually really closely. So to the point where when we have um, Invest Northern Ireland students overseas, often they're physically located in the embassies side by side with the DIT groups. Uh, and when I was in China working for DIT in the foreign office, you know, the Invest in my um, representative was about two meters from where I sat. So she was very intimately involved in the work we were doing on life sciences uh, into China. So I think there's a very um, close relationship on that. Um, when we look at potential investment conferences or work overseas, I mean, we, we, we need to use the DIT network because they've got you know, thousands of people overseas and we have 65. So, you know, we, we do try and make the most of that. And then some of the work they do in terms of organizing big conferences, bringing investors to the UK, you know, we, we want to be part of that network. And I think we have good relations with myself. Um, uh, and um, Steve Harper, our head of international meeting on a regular basis. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that the senior person from Derry actually in GIP who looks at um, strategic oversight uh, and international policy. So we actually have someone who understands when we talk about Northern Ireland what the benefits of it are. And we have seen some of the comments that have been reported around them talking about businesses in France or you know some things that stick out around what British companies can do in the most adverse situations. Um, and we have offered to um, run a series of information sessions again on what is Northern Ireland, you know, and what is the um, what are the characteristics of Northern Ireland as an investment destination. So we are working on that with the BIT. But I think generally it works um, really well. For the other bodies, Enterprise Ireland, I think we work with very closely, and I think there's some very interesting projects. Again, I've been to them this year at the senior level, uh, and there are some interesting cooperations I think we can do in some sectors like food, for example. Uh, and like yeah. life sciences, and I know they're very interested in that. Uh, we have to try and join with them, um, projects that we can support. We have talked about companies who operate both sides of the border and what we can do together in gar carbon and zero carbon carries and from funky things like that. Um, so, I, I, and we do, as you know, work with them on leadership projects where some of the leadership programs we work, it's in Enterprise Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland together. So, I think that works well. For IDA, I think it's a slightly different relationship. And to be honest, I think because of COVID, we haven't really had, I would say, the live interaction that I would have liked to have in the last 12 months. With IDA, I think we have to recognize is there are times when we could cooperate because actually the power of a UK, Ireland, or a whole of Ireland approach to attracting investment can work well for both Ireland and for Northern Ireland. And, and to be honest, there are times when we're going to compete like hell because if someone come here, we would rather it was um, in, the, in the, the north of the north and they would rather it was in the south of the south. So um, I, I think that relationship, we just need to kind of recognize where can we be stronger together and where should we have a kind of open and fair competition for investment. So I think that is some, some, some work that needs to be done still. Um, um, thank you for that. Um, I probably I'm going to come into market there, but just um, on that, um, I do think that that relationship is really important. When when I spoke to you before, um, Kevin, I think yes, I agree. Except that there is uh, a, a competitive age uh, for both organisations, obviously, but there there, there is definitely uh, synergy between 
because basically you're attracting investment if it comes in to the north of, of Ireland, um, uh, the northwest, it still affects the sub regional uh, employment status because they feed into that for the economy. For example, if it was in Donegal, so they do, it does have an economic impact right here on the island uh, and particularly in the border counties. And I think that it's really important that both organisations find a way of working uh, in synergy. And, and, and if ever there was a reason to do it, it's uh, the, the, the protocol. Uh, and I think that we need to, to do that. And just passing it back to, to, to Margaret as well, um, I would like to hear her um, thoughts on, on that uh, collaboration work as well. Yeah, I suppose something um, that goes at the heart of, of Intertrade Ireland is, is looking for those collaboration um, opportunities on, on an all-island basis. We have um, a synergy initiative where we're supporting cluster um, uh, all, the development of all-island clusters where there are economic benefits for um, for firms and, and for industry as, as a whole, because that often strays into um, sort of academic um, involvement as well. So um, one example of that would be the M1 Payments Corridor, which is a sort of um, a cross-border cluster of financial services companies involved in sort of payments and, and financial services um, where and um, those firms coming together makes a much more attractive proposition for future foreign direct um, investment on, on an all island basis. So we think there are there are many um, supply chain opportunities for and um, for Northern Ireland, this case for Northern Ireland and um, firms into the various different FDI um, pro, uh, companies in, in the in the Republic of Ireland, and we're actively helping companies on a day and daily basis to avail of those um, of those opportunities. Likewise, we're looking at um, low carbon um, initiatives on an all island basis, and again, looking where um, where there are collaborative opportunities for firms to and, and industries to work together to take um, advantage and they're all growing markets. They're driven sometimes by legislation, but driven by um, natural growth opportunities. So we are, that's something that's been at the heart of Intertrade Ireland since, since its inception and something that we will continue to grow into the future. Margaret, I note that the trade um, north to south is vastly greater than the trade south to north. Is there a way now that we can actually try and, and um, get those supply chains, you know, Northern Ireland businesses get more, uh, more trade from, from Southern businesses as a result? of Brexit, you know, if their supply chains were maybe traditionally in GB, is there any way that we can get them back? Uh, and is there a proactive campaign in order to look at the supply chains of, of southern businesses and to see if we can service them here with our northern uh, businesses? I'm going to bring um, Kerry in there in in the moment. I mean, we we we're all of us on our, of the belief, and our research has shown that there are um, additional um, uh, opportunities for for Northern Ireland firms and to ROI and, and and vice versa. And and we were heading the right way. Things were heading the right way prior to the um, pandemic hitting. Um, there, way, there may well be as, as supply chain, I think it's, it's still early to say, but um, you know, supply chains are still potentially adjusting to the, to the shock of, of, of COVID in, in, in many cases, but um, also um, the end of the, the transition period. We have sales supports um, and, and, and companies and, that are being used day and daily by, by companies, and we will continue to support them to take advantage of those um, opportunities as they, as they arise and, and evolve. And we will continue, I'll let Kerry come in and talk about our, our research plans. We'll continue to monitor um, this and, and um, opportunities that potentially arise. Um, Kerry, do you want to come in there? 
Yeah, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, so I, I suppose on this, what, what, you're absolutely right. We are there is a, a, a greater value of trade from north to south than south to north at present. Um, but what we have been seeing coming through the data is um, that, that uh, imports from Ireland into Northern Ireland have been uh, increasing at a, a really substantial rate uh, over recent years. And well, over the past 20 years that Intertrade Ireland's been in operation, we've seen average cross-border trade value grow at a rate of 4% per annum. And even in more recent years, that, that's increased to sort of like 6 7%. Per annum, and uh, although the most recent um, official data only goes up to 2018, uh, if we look at the Central Statistics Office data, we can see that continuing to grow in 2019 uh, and even in 2020, where we've had such a significant impact of the pandemic across all economies. The, the decrease in trade, as, as, you, as we've all experienced, the decrease in trade between Ireland and Northern Ireland it is, isn't that substantial. It's only in the region of, of a couple of percent. And we're hoping that as we, the lockdowns uh, uh, ease and trade normalises as we all get vaccinated, that these opportunities for cross-border trade really will increase. Uh, and in order to do that, we as an organisation have been linking in very strongly throughout uh, 2020 uh, using digital platforms with colleague organisations in uh, Ireland. So we've been linking very closely with the plans of our sponsorship department in, in Ireland uh, and also with the, the Brexit unit and the Taoiseach's office and the Shirt Island unit associated with that. Um, the Future Skills Group uh, in Ireland, the Future Jobs Ireland, and uh, also the, the new programme for government to ensure that wherever we can, we've identified um, throughout the island the opportunities for that cross-border engagement. And that's been primarily, as Margaret says, in those, those areas where we see real potential for really strong, strong growth now moving forward. So in the areas of low carbon, increasing our productivity, our life sciences, our advanced manufacturing, using new technologies and digitization um, to really help both economies to grow and grow cross-border trade at the same time. Those opportunities are absolutely there, and we've been working very hard to make sure that we take best advantage of them and that when we do all open up again and uh, if COVID eases, that the opportunities are, are, are there and uh, the policies are in place to enable um, that cooperation to happen. Thank you very much. That's uh, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just add, I mean, in, in terms of what Carrie has said, there's also supply chain support through the specialist framework that I referenced earlier. We've also developed supply chain checklists for businesses, um, and we're also in the process of developing a, a supply chain resilience and, and development framework um, through our operational excellence team. So that's about helping companies to actually maximize and to do strategic sourcing as well. So it's something that we have in plan in place as well. Uh, and just finally, um, can I say that you know it hasn't been all plain sailing for for our business community. Um, the the protocol um, has brought up and, and shone a light on and quite significant issues, particularly for businesses GB and I. And um, it, it's really important that they have a place to land if they're having difficulties uh, and they need support through the process. And as uh, as John Stewart uh, very ably. Um, indicated, you know, they need to be able to contact uh, people directly in order to get them through this. They're, you know, they're up for the challenge. They want to overcome the difficulties, um, but they need the support on the ground. So it was reassuring your response to his uh, his questions uh, as well. Uh, just finally, can I say there's a lot of political um, noise out there regarding the protocol, but I think it's really important that the business agencies, um, yourselves actually get on with the business of selling Northern Ireland, selling businesses in Northern Ireland, supporting Northern Ireland businesses north, south, east, west, uh, and operating effectively uh, and play the best team at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can we bring in Claire to the spotlight, please? 
Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for your presentations. Um, I, I suppose it just is to follow on from John Schwartz's uh, comments in relation to some of the grants and um, how that was facilitated. I just want to say thank you because, you know, certainly from a constituency office perspective, we have been inundated by that and we were following up and chasing up. And I know that it did put um, all organisations under pressure to be able to facilitate that. And there are still, I suppose, um, people waiting to, to be. To, to hear whether they're getting or not and you know as soon as that happens then everybody's happy i suppose and um, just even in relation to a bit of feedback around that what we find within the constituency office is that sometimes people were being told that they were not eligible for the grant um, but they weren't necessarily being told why and then it was up to us as an officer or, or the applicant to try and you know find out why that was and then usually it was because of a missing bit of information or detail um, that you could have been provided very quickly and then that information would have uh, would um, have helped get the grant straight away um, and I think you know, not being told that and maybe maybe there's not a, a, a way to facilitate that but it meant that people were being held up unnecessarily. So, you know, certainly if we ever find ourselves in a similar situation or, or if you're facilitating anything like this in, in the future, you know, I, I think um, that bit of information would have um, would have helped, you know, uh, it would have saved an awful lot of time for an awful lot of people, you know, and help, you know, get those grants on the ground where it matters just to try and, you know, keep these businesses ticking over until we can, you know, find ourselves out of the restrictions. Um, the other comment I would make as well is that the nibusiness.info website has been a lifeline for so many businesses. It's been a lifeline for my constituency office, and I really do value the information there. And, you know, if there are uh, any learning experiences from COVID, it is, you know, about providing information in that way. I, you know, I will say very um, openly that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it perhaps you know, wasn't getting information up as quickly as it needed to and all of that. But I would say now, a year later, it's probably one of the most efficient information systems across all government uh, departments. And I certainly know that, um, it, you know, businesses take value from that and it won't be just in relation to covid uh, restrictions and, and grant related information you know businesses really do appreciate that information and you know john uh, Stuart, as chair of the old party group for small businesses you know will concur that that's what businesses want you know that's what they're telling us they need knowledge they need information and that's what they really value because you know they, they can do what they need to insofar as selling their product or selling their service but it's all the other uh it's it's the rounded package of being a business and what that means um you know that that's really useful so i really do think we can utilize nibusiness.info particularly because people now know about it because of covid um and you know i just think there's a real opportunity there um and i suppose my other uh my last kind of point or question is is when i chat to businesses all the time they tell me you know they come to northern ireland they invest in northern ireland because of skills um, and it's really just a question are you hearing of any vulnerabilities in relation to skills you know is northern ireland you know are we still strong in that respect is there anything more we could be doing is there anything more the, the executive could be doing to, to ensure that we we do have the you know the best skilled people and people will choose us over other regions or or other areas okay thank you okay um, yeah, thank you thank you Claire. maybe i'll maybe i'll comment um just I mean, first of all, thank you for the feedback on the on the the emergency teams i appreciate that and you know i know the team who are Trying to feed live business info is pretty really hard work, and we do try and do it kind of live and up to date. Um, so, uh, which it has to be. If you're going to run it, you have to run it well. So, uh, I'll be very pleased to to hear your your feedback on that. And I, I got to write down your words. One of the most efficient across government. I got to put that on my screen table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple in terms of telling whether people are eligible or in, ineligible. I mean, there's sometimes there's eligible, ineligible, and then the kind of difficult bit in the middle and, and sometimes I've seen that where there are cases which are not always quick to answer it's the it's the bits which are hard to figure out actually so that maybe is some of the, the examples that you gave but it's a useful feedback as well for skills I think we, we have to um, invest Northern Ireland we run skills programs we, we particularly work on skills for leadership for business leadership for management development very keen on helping support skills for how do people export, um, how do you do innovation and technology. So we, 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 we are owners for some of that area, but clearly there is a whole area in um, skills which are not directly under our you know, responsibilities. But we're very keen to engage in the different parties who, who are engaged in that. So we do work with universities 
Um, I heard right in the beginning of the session that you're going to produce something, I think, on the 8th of March from the workshop you had a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we did participate in that through Niall Casey from our team, who is probably our expert in learning skills development. Um, what we can do and what we're trying to do more is match what do businesses need in the future with what is Northern Ireland producing towards that. And, you know, I think what we can see is we can see what sectors are growing. We can see what technology and support that they need. So we can predict a little bit what skills will be needed. Uh, and I think what we're trying to do is you know, make sure we've got a way of feeding that in. in a, I, think, I think there was a skills barometer before, but I think we're trying to find that in, in a, feed that in, in a more dynamic way to the people who are designing courses and predicting outputs of graduates and then looking at how do you reskill people who are going to have to change role over the coming years and just if, if collectively we can get that picture to fit better together then then i think that would be um, good for business and good for people um, and as you, as you know there will be a skill strategy published um, later this year it was i think due during 2020 but got move back a little bit because of COVID, but uh, we're certainly contributing whatever we can into into that. And we, we, we recognize that businesses don't grow unless you've got the right talent and skills to, um, to do that. And people don't get employed unless they've got the skills for the jobs which are available. So for both people and for businesses, you know, we've got to work collectively to make that, make that fit. We're very keen to do that. Okay. Um, no, that, that, I suppose that's kind of what I expected to hear. Um, you know, insofar as you know that it, it is important that um, we are developing the skills that businesses need and want. You know, and certainly, you know, one of my I suppose more favourite policy areas within the department is the Assured Skill programmes. And you know, every week we're hearing of academies which are taking on um, you know graduates and, and be able to. Uh, I suppose upskill them in a way which is specific to the needs of the business and I think that's clever I think you know that makes sense and you know certainly if government in Northern Ireland is able to provide those types of programs I would like to think that that in itself as a policy is, is something that would encourage business here and um, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking of skills very specifically this week because um, I've, I've got a bit of being in my bonnet about um the Job Start program in Northern Ireland, which has stalled because of finance, and I, I was given out about it um, in, in the budget bill last night that you know that money hasn't been found because I'm speaking to businesses and they're really disappointed by that because they are able to provide um, it, it's almost a way of upskilling you know through other programs and I appreciate it's not necessarily a Department for Economy program but it is a Department for Communities but it's another way of getting people into work and it's not you know, it, primarily it's, it's it's about those young people but it's also about business and ways that they can facilitate um uh young people into work and shape and mold them you know to, to be the the employees that they need and want for their business and um, so it's you're right it's 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 a whole range of skills you know from from whatever even invest and i are offering but it's also what government's offering not just within economy but within within other departments and you know i i, I do ask the question of businesses why northern ireland and that's what they tell me and i think that's where we need to keep our focus because we've done really well you know with in, in a number of over over the last 10 years and in, in encouraging fdi on that basis and you know it's it's a strength that we just need to we need to keep up so and can I just, just to add, as, as Kevin said, we, we have worked very closely with departmental colleagues in developing the Economic Recovery Action Plan. As you know, skills is kind of the major feature in that. And both ourselves and the AFE colleagues sit on the advisory board for the Economic Policy Centre that develops the skills barometer as well. So mm -hmm. all of those things is, is critically important. And, and again, um, through colleagues, um, Alan McKeown and other colleagues in the VET that are working with colleges as well, um, Steve Harper works very, very closely in terms of the Assured Skills um, program because it has a major impact in terms of supporting the AI companies coming in as well. They always find that very, very beneficial. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, it's good to hear that you're working with the FE colleges because I don't know if the pandemic, um, you know, that you know, there will be outworkings of the pandemic in this respect, but I, I think. 
I, I'm starting to hear inklings that younger people are wanting to stay at home. Maybe university is not the route that they want to necessarily pursue. And FE is a real good, is a real opportunity there because there's more of a regional um, balance in terms of FE colleges. So it's not just about necessarily going to to higher education in either Belfast or Derry or, or you know, even across the water or, or across the border. You know, they, they could potentially get those skills, you know, more locally to home at a point when that's all they can potentially afford. You know, so it's, um, I, I, I am, I, I think there's such potential with the FE colleges and and around skills, and I've I know I've seen that first time. So yeah. and, and some, of, some of the FDI interest we're getting as well, Claire, is um, they're not location specific. Um, so again, that's that helps the the digital engagement process, and it means that people will have access to jobs not in specific locations, which is helpful as well. Yeah, no, and, and that's interesting because I got similar feedback from quite a, a, a large company in Northern Ireland where they're not necessarily looking towards the main city centres anymore, yeah. um, but they do need to have those skills, whether they're in, you know, Corian or Acadie or Belfast or Derry, you know, um, and that's really important. And that's where FE can provide that support that maybe the two city centres can't. Yeah. Claire, can I come in on just on that, on that piece? Uh, Entry Ireland's been uh, very busy in the skills space, uh, as you might imagine, helping businesses to improve their innovation skills, their, their tendering skills, their trade skills, their digital skills, all of the, the things that uh, enable businesses to take advantage of opportunities for cross-border trade growth. Mm -hmm. And as we look to the, the challenges of the future around um, low carbon, the, the, the bioeconomy, the, the opportunity around life and health sciences and mass manufacturing. We've been working very closely with firms to see how we can upskill in those spaces so they can take advantage of cross-border growth opportunities. Uh, very specifically, uh, in Ireland, we've been looking at, uh, we've been feeding into the Future Skills Group, which in part looks at, uh, feeds into the Future Jobs Ireland, which is looking at uh, creating those high-value jobs of the future so that the economy um, benefits from that and we, we've been thinking about that from the context of both Northern Ireland and Ireland mm -hmm. and making sure that those opportunities and that where, there, where there are opportunities for um, extension of that into Northern Ireland and identifying the future skills needs that we, we make that happen um, and very specifically we fed into the OECD review of Northern mm -hmm. Ireland's skills which is fed into the Northern Ireland strategy which we're hoping to see soon um, to ensure that those opportunities for cross-border collaboration skills development um, takes place. Uh, and in that vein, we, we developed a, uh, an all-island uh, skills policy um, discussion, uh, which met virtually um, last year, and we hope that we'll continue to meet uh, in the future, just to really identify where the opportunities for synergy around skills exist, so that when we're looking at um, filling skills gaps, that we do that in the context of cross-border trade as well, so that mm -hmm. um, the opportunities uh, are, are matched by the skills that are available. Um, and much like uh, in Invest in I, we do feed into to the department in terms of skills needs and to, um, uh, I suppose at the moment, one of the things that we've been looking at is the shortage occupation list in relation to the change in immigration policies in the UK and how that will impact upon Northern Ireland firms. So I suppose we're in a situation where we've got two, two uh, I suppose, competing needs potentially, where we're looking at really driving forward these uh, high-end new skills around low carbon, new technologies, um, life and health sciences. But we also have firms here in Northern Ireland who need access to lower skilled work, so through the shortage occupation list. and. So uh, we're trying to tackle that from both ends so that firms here in Northern Ireland have the, the workers that they need for, for now, but are making strides towards um, being upskilled for the opportunities of the future. And I think that's the best that we can all achieve. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And, I, you know, I'm a big fan of making opportunities and there's no borders when it comes to opportunities. And, you know, I, I think it's 100 percent that, you know, we do look across the island and indeed, you know, even within the British Isles as well. You know, I, I, I'm very keen to ensure that we, we grow this culture of interdependency because I think it, it, it benefits everyone. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really good to hear that. And also, you know, just even in, in respect of lower skills, you know, compared with future skills and, and um, maybe digital skills or all that, that's really important. You know, every day I have businesses and 
some companies in my constituency saying to me, Claire, we don't have HGV drivers, we don't have welders, we don't have all those different things. And, you know, those are the cogs in the wheels to get to all those other higher level stuff. So, you know, um, I, I think it's good that we are looking at it on a holistic, you know, um, high, low, you know, uh, left, right, you know, kind of, pers you know, perspective. I think that's really important. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Can we bring Christopher into the spotlight, please? Hello there, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Yes, yeah. Yes, that's good. Um, in terms of recently, the uh, last week, the Economy Minister uh, published the Economic Recovery Action Plan. I'm just wondering um, if you could give me your assessment of that and um, how you think that uh, will help us in terms of building what we go forward out of uh, the present restrictions that we're living under. Um, so, certainly, I've certainly read the plan and um, we've um, given input into the um, recovery action plan as it was being put together. Um, I know it's not the sole um, plan that will be you know, published by the department. I think this is very much the, the groundwork plan. And I think some of the kind of longer term future ambitions will be published um, kind of later on soon, but um, still a little bit later on. You know, I think the, um, the things in there, R&D and innovation is really important. And, and I was really pleased to see innovation you know, front and center in that plan, one of the four areas that were highlighted, because particularly for me, given that the world has changed, consumer demand has changed, industrial demand has changed, the whole way to convert has changed, you can't copy and repeat your way to greatness. Now. You have to innovate and do things differently. So I, I certainly welcome that um, being a key part of it. And then clearly skills are a you know, really important part as we've just been um, discussing with Claire. So I, I think the plan um, certainly contains a lot of things. It's got the, kind of the things that have been done, things which are being done, and the things which will be done. Uh, and particularly for the things which will be done, a number of the actions and activities in there are things that will be incorporated into our business plan for 2122, uh, and then will lead into kind of further actions beyond that. So, you know, I thought it was a sound basis to start recovery in Northern Ireland. But I do recognise as well. I think the comment when it was um, published was that this is a living document, you know, and I think the world is moving so fast. There's never going to be going to publish a, a leather-bound encyclopedia of a recovery plan, and that's it. You know, it's going to have to adapt and uh, uh, and change as the situations change. Uh, and in particular, I think yesterday, because the pathway to exit from restrictions was published, as as the you know as the Northern Ireland moved through those nine pathways and the five different stages, I can imagine that the recovery plan will have to adapt to that as well, um, particularly in the the work pathway and how we start bringing people back to the office and what impact that has on city centres, uh, and then also things like hospitality and uh, you know some of the sectors which have been hardest hit. So, yeah, I, I thought it was a um, very positive plan and kind of I think quite well received. Good. I think it's important that the, the finance minister should um, commit to the, the financial support that that plan needs. I think it's the um, announcement of the provisions of the protocol has a single business said to you that they'll be coming to Northern Ireland because of the provisions provided there? We've had a, a, we've had a number of businesses who have talked to us, and it's double-digit numbers. It's not, it's not hundreds, but it's not single digits, who have expressed that interest in Northern Ireland, which is, which is at least in part being generated because of the unique situation of Northern Ireland in 2021 and going forward. And are these uh, manufacturing businesses or service businesses? Yeah, a, a, lot, a lot of it is manufacturing, actually. Yeah. Okay, and presumably they're not importing any other parts from GB because under the provisions of the protocol, that's an absolute nightmare at the present time. Well, we, we recognise that you know, there are frictions and you know, Northern Ireland imports £10 billion pounds of goods from GB. I mean, it's a major, major source of imports and you know, some businesses, if you're... It's like if you wanted to do assembly in, in Northern Ireland and 95% of the products you're going to assemble are coming from GB, I think you would look very carefully at the frictions and challenges bringing goods in from um, Britain into Northern Ireland. You know, other types of manufacturing businesses would source from different places or using primary raw materials where actually that 
frictions and those challenges would be much less of a impact on what they could do over here. So, so yeah, not, I think we need to work through business by business. And at the moment, our main conversations are, you know, come and talk to us, actually, because we need to get granular and get real life converting what may be opportunities into some will be good to go and some will be maybe not yet and some will be perhaps not. But um, the key thing right now is trying to get businesses to talk it through with us. Well, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't expect anything more from a, or less from a marketing body. I mean, your job is obviously to try and encourage people and say to them, come to Northern Ireland, this is a good place to do business. If 95% of manufacturers are bringing products from GB and the provisions of this protocol don't apply to services, where's the benefit for anybody in it? So, so the, 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 the kind of um, I mean, the kind of companies who've been been interested and have been talking to us are sometimes where it's um, regulated, you know, and, and people who are looking at um, uh, can I can I make something in Northern Ireland and access the European Union and Britain at the at the same time um, using a regulatory system that will be accessible for both because Britain will accept accept things which have been made under European regulations for Europe. So those are the kind of businesses who are who are talking to us. I presume that the primary reasons why people are indicating to you that they're coming and they're setting up businesses and investing in Northern Ireland is because we have effectively lower lower costs, a lower cost of living, and a highly educated workforce. Those saying that they're doing so because of the provisions of this protocol, I presume are in a tiny, tiny minority. I mean. Yeah. Um, You've actually you've told me you've had some queries about it, but no one has actually said, yes, we're investing here because of the protocol. We're coming here because we have a younger, highly educated workforce. We have lower operating costs and we have a lower cost of living. Yeah, and we have some you know, world-class um, technology, which is the, the other reason people come. So you know, there, there is a, a long list. When we, when we do our sales pitch for Northern Ireland, we have a, a long list of um, benefits uh, for why you should set up in Northern Ireland that businesses um, listen to. And, and I don't think any business would come for a single reason, you know, whether it was a dual market access or young talent or cyber security. It's, uh, they, they're making an assessment on a, a, a series of factors. And that's what's happened. I mean, in the last five years, we had 99 foreign investors that we brought into Northern Ireland. You know, we've got a strong pipeline for the future. Um, you know, I, I hope that we can increase the number of businesses who will come here in the future, but because of the core talent and benefits of um, working with Northern Ireland, and because we should be able to use the 2021 and this global turbulence to communicate to more people who have a willing ear to listen um, to you know, where they will set up next, given the global supply chains have changed so much. I think even during the pandemic, a thousand jobs have been created in tech, which is demonstrative of Northern Ireland as a, as a leader in, in technology and, and uh, information technologies and, and innovation in that regard, all of which predates um, this cumbersome and unworkable um, protocol. So look, um, thank you for all that you do. I'm really encouraged to hear um, your support for the Economic Recovery Action Plan. And I think it's important that we get through that because to be honest, we are facing into the prospect of up to 100,000 of our people losing jobs once furloughs come to an end. So um, you're obviously going to be a key player in helping us to recover that situation. Um, um, again, just uh, thank you for your answers. Very much appreciated, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, th um, thank you. Um, uh, can I just ask a question? Both of you is in your briefing. Um, reference the the supports to businesses um, in dealing with COVID and uh, and particularly the the digital capability um, support, which is one that we we have had some good feedback around. Um, is that something that you intend to uh, continue and develop some more? Um, and just to put that to both of you, and, and maybe Kevin, if I could just ask um, about the schemes that you have developed over the past year. Um, I assume that you know feedback from those has been taken on board in terms of developing the new ones. Um, as a committee, we had some negative feedback around the, the support that uh, provided for
cons consultants to give advice to businesses. Um, they just didn't feel that that was an appropriate support at that particular time. So I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to that a, a little bit as well. Um, yeah, I will do. I mean, first thing is, uh, a lot of these recovery schemes, if they've been built at real pace and they are done through full business appraisal, so value for money, additionality, um, is it mobile? So we, we, we've approached those in a very different way than the emergency um, schemes. Um, but to be honest, I don't think Invest Northern Ireland has ever launched so many schemes in one year. So we are moving at pace with you know, quite, a, quite a constrained resource. For some of them, then, they've been oversubscribed, I would say even heavily oversubscribed. So, for example, the Productive Investment Capital Grant, you know, we had to pause applications because there were just so many people applying. We didn't want people to apply when we think the funds are, are used up. Um, and we will look next year at whether we can set aside some funds to be able to reopen applications um, in the future if we can. For, for things like digital capability, I thought that was like the digital selling was quite a nice example because we opened the first grant um, for kind of larger businesses. You know, re retail. I think you had to have more than ten employees. Well, you, did, you had to have more than ten employees, um, and we got really good take up of it. And it was a way of helping really in, often indigenous, indigenous and domestic companies access uh, further markets and new markets through a novel digital channel. So that worked really well. Then I know there was feedback and lots of people in the smaller group, less than 10 people were saying, well, we want to be able to do that as well. And we want access to that kind of program. So then we got a second wave of funding of 3 million pounds to be able to do the same digital selling grant, but for businesses which are between one and 10. And I know we've had um, a lot of applications for that scheme as well. And we're starting to roll that out. So, you know, I, I think we have you know, learned a lot through the year. Um, and adapted some of the schemes accordingly. The, the other thing we've learned a lot is that it was very hard to get many of these schemes up and running early on, but we were doing them in a way that um, was online for the first time, but we were very much tailored towards PCs and computers. And you know, as, we, as we look at, okay, who's applied and how did they apply? You know, we, we were quite surprised really about just the number of people who are not doing these kind of applications on a PC anyway, but it's all very much being done on mobile phones. And um, what we're learning through that is that as schemes in the future, we have to make sure it's um, dual platform, dual platform friendly, and not that you, it's um, PC friendly, but can also be used on a mobile. We'll have to find ways of working it um, for both. So we certainly have done um, some um, some learning through that. But for the digital, sorry, for the business and financial planning grant, which I think is the one you're you're referring to. And I, I'm not sure the feedback you've had that was, you know, was, was critical on that. What we were trying to put in place is um, a mechanism for companies to look at their future and to uh, get some really good external professional advice on strategy and business planning and how to face this massively different situation. Um, and I think the argument we were using is that if we use external consultants, external consultants may have worked with 10 businesses, so they can bring acquired expertise in a very difficult year and deploy that into a new business, which is why the grant was set up to, to provide you know, business and financial to, to support at quite a high percentage. Uh, and what we did do was set up a system to accredit the, um, the different professional um, services providers so that we had some way of knowing that there was a pool of people who you know, we had some confidence in would to deliver good advice through the scheme. So I knew I knew that how, that's how it was approached to chair. You know, I'm not sure if you've got feedback that that wasn't entirely successful, but certainly happy to hear that and happy to build that into future schemes. Thank you, Kevin. So, Margaret, did you want to come in? Uh, yes, um, just to say, Chair, we, we introduced what's called our eMERGE um, programme, which is a I suppose, digital um, online sales support programme. We introduced that right at the beginning of, of the pandemic. We, we surveyed companies that were active on our, on our programmes and, and supports, and that was one of the key pieces of feedback that we received, that companies wanted support in, in that area. 
it's um it's 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 not a large grant it's actually quite a um a small grant it's 100 percent funded but i think the key thing was we matched the company with an expert in that area so for many companies even if if you give digital sales support well, well where did this start they don't they don't know what they don't know so we were able to put together a panel of of experts and the feedback has been um so positive from from companies they've been able basically to move from traditional you know where they had many companies had their sales rep out on on the road which wasn't um uh, possible during um COVID. but many of them have um you know learned to um that this is in many ways the way forward in terms of so for many business it actually reduces costs that they may not they may reevaluate how they will sell um, going forward. So we, um, this is a, a scheme that has been, we've received additional funding from, from DFE and our sponsor department um, in ROI to, to roll out, but we very much see it as part of our, our sales, our suite of sales supports going forward, because I think that's where the, the market is, is going and, and that will be a key part of, of trade and sales going forward. Yeah, um, I think that, that it is important um, going forward, even, you know, just to build capacity with particularly small business and to help them, you know, respond to the new ways of working and, and even to build resilience for, for the future. I think, you know, in some respects, the trends that have been accelerated because of the pandemic are going to continue rather than reverse to how we worked before. So I think that it is, you know, and there are real there are real. Um, opportunities there for businesses as well to, to move on to those digital platforms because a lot more people are now using those um, themselves to, to buy and to, um, to, to do business themselves. Um, and I, I just suppose, Kevin, to pick up on um, the, the support that Invest is offering, and I know this is something we've discussed before as well, but particularly in terms of the economic recovery and ensuring that those like small and micro businesses have um, access to, to the business supports. Um, is that something that will be incorporated into your recovery plans and is being incorporated? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, um, um, the, the work we do, the, the majority of the work we do, the majority of the offers we make, I think it's more than 90% are to um, SMEs. Um, so, uh, although I know a lot of the big announcements that come out are for KPMG or experts or you know, larger companies, um, but the, the, you know, the work on the ground, you know, sometimes less well noticed is a um, majority to SMEs uh, and clearly will continue going forward because you know, we, we need that group of companies to be successful for Northern Ireland and to recover. And I think what we've learned in the last year is that because we've got this digital delivery mechanism, we are able to access them more readily. Um, in, in the past, you know, if you look at 2018, 2019, we would have needed to bring 20 companies into a room and talk to them about export. Now, I know people are maybe a little bit tired of digital delivery at the moment because it's the only mechanism. But if we look next year, the year after, where people are probably partly in the office, partly working from home, you know, I think some of the things we've learned in digital delivery and digital training would be really helpful for uh, lots of um, small and micro businesses um, uh, across Northern Ireland. And I think some of the skills that we've just talked, some of the things we just talked about in terms of digital transformation and digital skills, we've learned a lot as well. And I think our own digital transformation journey will accelerate, uh, which I think will help um, accessibility to, to many businesses across uh, Northern Ireland, even in that you know, smaller than 10 or 10 to 50 Group. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, things like the innovation vouchers, I think, have been really popular this year. Actually, we've had a lot of um, requests for those. So, you know, there, there are a number of schemes tailored to some of the smaller businesses, um, which is certainly very appropriate for startups, entrepreneurs, uh, and even small businesses which have been running for a while but want to do something differently. So, we certainly encourage them to um, to get in touch with us. Yep. And again, Jim, all, all of the advice clinics for EU exit are open to all businesses, regardless of size, scale, or location. Okay. 
No, thank you for that. And I think, you know, it is something that, that we're very mindful of as a committee. Also is, you know, that the vast majority of our businesses are SMEs and it's about making sure that they all get supported um, in terms of, of the economic recovery and have access to that support. And um, I think your, your briefings today have been really useful to us in terms of understanding, you know, where we are currently and and what you are planning to do in the time ahead. And, and I'm sure we will be in, in further discussions with you over, over the next few months um, and um, look forward to, to that as we, we map our way out of this. So thank you very much for taking the time and coming to talk to us and for giving us um, those two hours this morning. It has been really, really useful. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, um, is there anything that people want to raise at, at this point? Are there any actions that you want to suggest coming out of the briefing? Chair? Yep, go ahead, John. Can we get more detailed in terms of the cross border trade referred to? Uh, in the brief of Minter Trade Ireland, just in terms of the latest figures uh, in, in that regard? Yep, we can ask for that. Okay. Okay, members, unless anybody has any additional points, we will move on. Peter, is there anything you want to pick up on before we... Well, there's a couple of um, bits of housekeeping information we go through the department to get. Um, we, we use the department as a conduit to uh, INI and ITI, but it's just bits and pieces that I'm curious about um, in terms of the, the operations that Invest has outside, you know, the 65 people abroad, where they are, what they do, and so on. Um, it's something that's been highlighted to us by the CEO committee, the DEO committee, sorry, um, in, in terms of, you know, what, what they do, how that's measured, and so on. So if members are content, I want to follow up on that just to, to see exactly how that is done. Um, yep. And then a couple of other bits and pieces around... Um, the clarifications and services and so on going forward. I have a few specific questions I want to put through to the to the um, department on that. So yeah, we have a few bits of pieces to tidy up, Chair. Okay. No, that's grand, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on then to, to matters arising. Um, and there's a few here, so we'll try and get through them all as quickly as possible. Um, at 5.1, page 29 of your packs, there is a letter from the ERA committee clerk regarding correspondence received by the committee for ERA um, on the RHI scheme. So if members are agreed, the clerk um, will respond to the ERA clerk sharing the responses that we as a committee have recently received from the department on the RHI scheme and the consultation um, that is out at the minute. Are members content? Okay. Great. Um, then at page 30 of your pack, there's a response from Lord Agnew regarding tariffs for agri-food products remaining in the north. The committee had written to the Cabinet Office in January to ask how businesses um, can evidence if goods will remain in the north for consumption. And the reply says that those businesses can apply for the UKTS authorisation, allowing them to self-declare um, that they are staying in the UK for consumption. And this can be done online. So are members content to note? Okay. Thank you. So then page 31, there is a response from Treasury regarding support for students as a result of lockdown. The committee had written to um, the Treasury back in January to question what further support the British government would offer students. Um, and the, the response has highlighted that the British Department for Education has announced 70 million to support students and the executive will receive Barnet consequentials from this. So um, are members content to note at this stage, or um, can we find out a little bit about that, Peter? Um, John Stewart wants to... Chair, sorry, um, can we find out some details uh, about that, uh, Barnet Consequential, and uh, precisely where the support is going to go to? Because yep. there's, uh, as we all know, a significant number of students that are not getting any money at all. Yep. Okay. I didn't mean... Yeah, uh, Chair... Yes, go ahead, Stuart. Okay, I just to follow up on what Steve was saying, I think that's important because there are some students, groups of students in Northern Ireland that are losing out, but there are also Northern Ireland students going to universities in other places losing out. Um, and whether UK universities are expected to support them or 
where they're uh, we are supported required to support them is is important and needs to be resolved. Okay, we'll we'll do that. John, uh, John, we'll add again as well. John Stewart, are you wanting to come in now, or is it AOB that you're wanting to come in on? You're muted, John. It's a, yep, it's another matter arising from the minutes, Chair, from last week's meeting. I don't know whether you want to it now or at AOB, but yeah, it is go, a matter arising from last Go week's ahead, meeting. John. Um, it's just regarding um, the job start scheme. I was just wondering if there's been any response by the Davo regarding that. I'm, I'm just concerned that time is running out for the scheme that really should be off the ground, given our prioritisation focus on developing young people and skills and getting them into getting employment through these internships. And I just think it is genuinely worrying that it doesn't seem to be getting any traction and that people are not um, getting back to us regarding this and on what that department is doing to promote the scheme. There are both um, people, students who have come out of full-time education ready to take up these positions and businesses who had prepared to bring people on and have now been left in limbo. And I, I just think we have responsibility as given the impact that is going to have on the local economy to try and get an answer for them ahead of the new financial year starting. Chair, we, we have cars sorry. We have we have correspondence out to the community's minister on that. We would anticipate getting that back for next week's pack. Um, but we'll, we'll give an extra push on that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Chair. John O'Dowd, were you wanting to come in as well? Uh, yes, Chair. It was on the previous side. I was just, I think it has been clarified. Last week we asked questions about how the Student Hardship Fund is working in England, Scotland, and Wales. I thought that perhaps was the response to that, but it appears that was a response to a letter in January, so there's still further information to come through, I think. Yeah, we, we are still waiting on. This this one chair, I suppose we should probably should have flagged that up was was in response to, as as Mr. O'Dowd has said, a, a letter we sent in January before any of the new schemes had been announced. So it's kind of working in detail around that. We've also got um, correspondence out to the relevant Scottish minister on the back of information we got from NUS USI last week around how Scotland's got a task force for students going forward and what they're doing, how they're funding that and what the detail is on it. So we've got that to come back as well. Okay, so members are happy. We'll move on then to um, 5.4, which is at page 27 of table papers. There's a response from the Minister on the budget requirements for skills. The Minister agrees that securing additional funding is essential to address the need to upskill and reskill individuals whose jobs have been impacted by the pandemic and also invest in the workforce of the future. The Minister highlights that within the draft skills strategy due to be issued for consultation next month, one of the key recommendations within the strategy is an establishment of a ring fence skills fund. And the Minister has spoken um, about this at a number of occasions when she has uh, addressed questions in the Assembly. So are members content that we would seek some further information on this? Yep. yep, thank you. Okay, so moving on then to page 29 of table papers, there is a response from the Minister regarding expanding the COVID distribution payment scheme to include students such as those at local theological colleges and part time students who are currently excluded. The COVID distribution payment is for full time UK and EU students at Northern Ireland publicly funded higher education institutions and full-time higher education students at further education colleges, as such payments will issue directly from the institutions and not from the department, and that this, as the department has said, is the only feasible way for a scheme of this size to work. The payment is for the North publicly funded higher education institution, and this excludes the theological colleges and other alternative providers which are not in receipt of recurrent grant funding from the department. The minister advises that the department does not have the legal basis to make payments to such institutions. So our members, uh, do, do any members want to make any comments in respect of that? I'm disappointed, Chair, but I'm happy enough to note it. Um, if it is a legal position, it is a legal position. And um, I presume the minister is acting on the basis of advice given to her by the legal people in her department, but um, as I say, slightly disappointed with the response, but it is what it is, I suppose. Thanks, sure. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, uh, on, on the broader issue, including in terms of the reference to the letter to colleges, 
It's worth noting we are a legislative assembly, and if there are legal barriers to us providing support in a pandemic to people who need support, then if the legislation needs amended or overhauled, then we have the capacity to do it. Okay. Um, Paul, do you have your hand up? Do you want to come in as well? Can we bring Paul into this? Can we bring Paul into the spotlight, please? Paul Gavin. There we go. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and just to echo what Christopher has said, um, disappointed in terms of the response. Uh, although I do pick up on what John O'Dowd has said that. You know, if a legislative vehicle can be identified to make payments um, legal in that respect, then I would be very much um, supportive of seeking to identify a way for that to be taken forward. Um, whether that's in this current financial year, um, given uh, the ability uh, to try and address it. And I note that the budget bill is being put through the assembly, and this is very short notice in that respect, but is there the potential of asking the economy uh, minister to provide a suitable amendment to be uh, brought forward at the consideration or further consideration stage in order to provide the legal varies um, to then make such payments to the students that this committee have talked about. And I agree in terms of the, the broader scope of it needing to be made applicable around theological colleges and also the areas that, that John and I has highlighted in previous weeks. Uh, and I, I would support this committee uh, writing to the economy committee or to the economy minister uh, and asking as a matter of urgency to explore whether or not such an amendment could be brought forward to the budget bill and um, to provide legal barriers for the uh, department for the economy to try and make this a reality. Um, if, well, if, that, uh, if that's a formal proposal, I'm happy to second it. Um, I, I think that that is something the committee is likely to support. Um, are members content? Yep. Yes, I'm content. Yep, yes. Thank you. Okay. okay, then. So moving on to five point six, page fifty, or sorry, thirty-one of table papers. There's a response from the minister on the FSB furlough proposal. Um, the minister's official have recently engaged with HMRC colleagues on the possibility of developing and implementing a furlough top-up scheme in the manner um, outlined by the FSB proposal. And unfortunately, these discussions have shown that it would not be possible to implement such a scheme in this financial year. However, the department will continue to engage um, with HMRC and look at options. So are members content to note at the, this point? And obviously, members will likely be aware that it will be announced um, in the Chancellor's budget statement today that furlough will be extended to the end of September, which is positive as well. Okay, okay so moving... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you okay, Sinead? Do you want to come in or are you just agreeing? Yeah. yeah. Agreeing. <laughs> okay, so moving on then to page 33 of table papers. There's a response from the Minister um, regarding the administration and data gathering um, required for possible further support measures for those impacted by the COVID pandemic. The committee had written to the Minister on the 14th of September 2020, and this is the reply. The Minister clarifies that at the time of the committee meeting, access to data held by HMRC had been flagged as a potential issue in developing further support schemes. The Department has had ongoing engagement with HMRC on several matters regarding support measures. HMRC confirmed that they would not be able to provide the required information on self-employed individuals. The Department continued to develop schemes and have now introduced schemes to support both newly self-employed individuals and limited company directors, which were two of the groups identified as not receiving support at the time. Further to this, the Department has introduced the COVID Restrictions Business Support Scheme, which is available to many who were not eligible for previous support, such as the £10,000 Small Business Grant Scheme. Although we do know, Peter, that individuals have been able to get their HMRC data to support applications for support schemes. From what I can gather, Chair, that's still an ongoing conversation. I know the Department um, is in regular contact with HMRC about this, and, and it's part of the evolving landscape of what's going to happen coming into the new financial year in terms of new schemes. Um, I think it's been a gradual case of, I don't want to say wearing HMRC down, but... Uh, Getting, getting 
better contact, finding the people that they need to talk to more and lifting it up to a policy level. So I think the department has some hope that they'll be able to keep that moving on. Okay. Are members content to note? Thank okay. you. Moving Chair, on. Chair, can I just come in for a second? Yes, go ahead, go John Stewart. Um, it sort of falls on nicely from the previous point. I was trying to come in on it as well, but I couldn't get on you for some reason. But it's just a highlight. There are directors out there who are still really struggling to get access to funding for themselves. And when you factor in the previous point about the money that is having to be paid um, to support for workers, I mean, it is great that we still have that for the screen in place, 80%, but between 30 and maybe 50 pounds per employee per week to a director is, is, is a serious amount of money if you get 10 employees. And it's not a big company with 10 employees and you know and that's a got to 600 pounds a week going out just to support the workers so i think we're heading towards a really difficult period for some of these businesses who are on their last legs that money is it, just not going to be there and they're going to be faced with either having to let those staff go or keep the business so um anything that can be done to support both the directors who can't because again if they're a director they can't even further themselves because they're probably not down as an employee so they're having to pay out of their own pocket to support furloughed workers at the same time having nothing to keep the um, the, the, the uh, dogs at bay in the pressures that they're facing. So I do think any pressure that can be put to try and get that moving and get support for them on those teams would be very beneficial. Chair, I'm aware those conversations are, are, are happening within the department in terms of how they are looking at budgeting for COVID relief going forward. Members are aware that money has already been um, earmarked and we expect a fair bit more, and there'll be barnet consequences of announcements that are made out of the budget today. So, as far as I'm aware, that the department is looking now at new ways to fill those gaps that Mr. Stewart has identified, and we we have a, a, a standing request to the department to flag up when they're looking at new um, new policies or where they've discovered they can they close gaps, where they're going to. Um, change the criteria for existing schemes and so on. So that, that is there, and we, we understand that those discussions are ongoing. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to page 35 of table papers, there is a departmental response regarding an analysis on why there is a lower than expected number of applications for COVID financial support schemes by businesses. The department advises it is not possible to estimate with any degree of certainty how many applicants will qualify for support the unprecedented circumstances of the pandemic and the subsequent restrictions require support schemes to be developed at speed. Therefore, it is not possible to make detailed analysis of the number of potential individuals or businesses that could apply for each scheme. Um, the wet hubs and large hospitality tourism schemes are different in that the number of applicants is known and they are approached by the department other, rather than the other way around. So that's to note unless members have any comments. Chair, just one comment on that, if I may. Yep, go ahead. Um, I, when we had the departmental official entry quite recently, I asked if there was any scope to extend the wet pub scheme to include sports and social clubs on a bar on the premises, and that was being undertaken, and there was some positive mood music coming out of that discussion. Is that in any way being referred to subsequent to that discussion? I think it was three weeks ago now. I've asked a couple of questions and no response relating to that. I'm just wondering if the committee's received anything. Chair, as far as I'm aware, uh, that, that's um, being discussed and looked at by the executive because it cuts across a number of departments. Members will be aware that um, funding for sports clubs and so on has primarily come from communities and that they have worked with the finance minister on how that can be evolved. And I think that the discussions are ongoing between those ministers and the economy minister in terms of who's been missed out by the existing schemes and how they might then be able to be incorporated into new funding that comes available in the new financial year. So I know that is one that they're still working on. Uh, Chair, can I just come in briefly here? Yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Um, in, in relation, well, it, it goes across uh, the grant schemes and furlough, but um, there are many businesses that have indicated, if, even if they are allowed to open, but have to open in a restricted manner, 
in relation to uh, social distancing and that it wouldn't be economically viable for them to do so because their businesses or their shop floor or their restaurant floor is too small to, to, to um, facilitate that uh, and they're opening up at a loss. So it's really important that you know, support can continue for those businesses that think that they can't actually open up uh, and be viable. Uh, until it's fully open, until they get to the st stage five um, of um, the, the the projection and stage five, whenever that will be, um, uh, as uh, as a result of, of the uh, gradual opening up process that we have uh, seen yesterday. So it's important that support continues on for those businesses. So we have to kind of keep a very close eye on that. Um, it's not everybody that can open up at the designated times. Chair, I'm aware that um, the department's keeping a, a very close engagement with stakeholders on how that's going to um, work out. We've got um, Netta up next week, who will give us a bit of insight into the discussions that have been had with tourism and hospitality around that. Uh, but I know that the department's engaging with all of the representative bodies in terms of what the, the restrictions as they ease look like and I think there's probably likely to be um, discussion in the budget announcements today and there may well be born in consequentials from that so I suspect there will be additional funding around that also there, there's a likelihood that existing schemes can be adapted to accommodate that partial reopening um, because it will still be COVID restrictions um, so yeah. I think that's all still being discussed. I suppose at the end of the day, it's going to be the budget available. Um, but that, that I think, is something that's being looked at um, as we speak. Chair, can I come in on that? Yes, go ahead, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, the, the Deputy Chair said about people opening at designated times. Would the designated times were actually such a thing um, was outlined um, yesterday? I think um, one thing that I thought was interesting in the, the document that was published yesterday. It's clear now, up until this point, uh, the sole and overriding consideration, in, and I'm not trying to be political, and I'm, I'm not trying to get an argument going. You know, it's not like me, but I'm not. Um, the, the one thing that um, was in the document yesterday was that uh, I took away from it was up until this point, it is clear that the overriding and singular focus um, has been upon health implications. It's clear now that the executive is adopting a broader approach in terms of health as one um, implication or one factor, but so too now, I think more prominently, and I think rightly so, as the vaccine uh, is rolled out and the situation improves vastly, um, so too is the economy. I think there's an opportunity for us as a committee in this, in terms of seeking to press for uh, further information, because the response to the document that was published yesterday by the business community, whilst they were polite, was overwhelmingly negative. And I think we as an economy committee have a role to play in articulating their concerns and the need that they have for certainty and as the deputy chair referred to dates. I think that's really important that we, we do get more clarity around this. So if yesterday was a starter for 10, um, just as the economic recovery action plan is, I really think that we as a committee have a role here in pursuing dates and providing businesses certainty. Um, I know that other members will disagree with me, but I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, thank you, Christopher. John O'Dowd? Thank you, Chair. Um, but, but I think uh, it's important that the entire community, the business, workers, families, all those people out there who make up our community are reassured that the plan that was published by the executive yesterday is a roadmap out of lockdown. And no one can, and there are, there are dates contained within the roadmap. There are four review dates contained within the roadmap. And indeed, I suspect if the figures continue to improve and the data that we're seeing from the rollout of the vaccination program continue to show positive results, 
that the ongoing review process of the roadmap will allow us to open up the economy in our society much quicker. But in regards spokespersons for the business sector, and Sinead raised an interesting point here as well. There are businesses that will want to open up more quickly, uh, but there are also businesses who are very, very nervous about opening up uh, in any form of restricted way because they simply can't afford to do so. Their business model isn't designed to open up in the, the, the COVID restrictions, either large or small. So I, I, I'm not sure there is a unified voice in the business sector uh, out there. Um, I have businesses on to me who, yes, want to open up. If other businesses on to me are saying, please be very, very careful before you reopen us again because we simply can't afford another false dawn. So as with all these things we've experienced during the COVID pandemic, there are many, many different views, many, many different opinions. But we have learned over this last year that when we have false dawns, uh, we cost businesses money and we also cost lives. So the, the executive roadmap allows for review dates. Um, and I think that it would be a mistake for the committee to start muddying the waters or causing further confusion, all those words that are very popular in the media uh, to, to use. We have to trade cautiously and open up when it is safe to do so, both in terms of health, community and uh, business. Chair, can I suggest we, we, we do go to the department and seek their understanding of the metrics they're working to with regard to business? Um, because obviously they're feeding into this whole process, this, this kind of three-pillared process. Um, we have NETA up next week, the, the, the Tourism Alliance, um, who can give a, a, a good insight into the sort of engagement they've got. And I think it'll be useful to hear the concerns they have around um, what the deputy chair and what other members have, have highlighted around partial reopening and how affordable that is. So if, if members are content, we can ask the department for just, just exactly what they're inputting into the process of getting restrictions lifted and how that works and, and what they're working to. Like, words, they must have some kind of trigger point in mind um, in terms of a measurable metric. That might well be the same word twice. Um, but if members are content, we'll find that out from the department. What exactly are they working to? Is that possible? Chair, I, I think that it will be important just what uh, today's budget um, uh, says today in, in relation to the Barnet Consequential and what money and what support will come uh, to Northern Ireland. So that may have a, a, an impact on just um, how we can support businesses through this uh, opening up phase. I hear the chair. I, I, I hear, is that your dog in the background, Sinead? <laughs> as long as you don't set him on me. Um, no, I, I hear um, what what other members are saying, but I am mindful. You know, around Christmas time, people were told celebrate your Christmas at Easter, and um, that is now apparently not going to happen. I'm also mindful of the fact that. Because, I mean, we're now past half a million vaccine doses issued. The statistics do demonstrate to us who the most vulnerable from this virus are. It's people over 70. My understanding is that more than 90% of the most vulnerable group have now received their first vaccine and are soon to receive their second one. In those circumstances, I think that it's reasonable for us and also uh, I think that people are increasingly well, and John talked about the whole community, and he's absolutely right about the whole community. Um, you know, I mean, my wee girl's in P6, she's lost the entirety of her P6 year. You know, my son is recently diagnosed as dyslexic, and we're waiting for a statement. You know, so, I mean, the entire community at, at different aspects has, has suffered uh, as a consequence of this. I, I, I'm happy to go along with you know listening to what you say to speak, but I do think as a certainly as a department, I hope that the Department for the Economy is pressing for more information in terms of what the rules actually are. There's another thing that I think really upsets and annoys people is this sense that the goalposts keep moving. And I think um, if 
the Department for the Economy is pressing for you know, what are what are the targets that need to be met before we can do X, Y, and Z. I think that would be a useful exercise for the department to be undertaking. But look, I, I take on board the points that John has made as well. Thank you, Christopher. Um, Paul, are you wanting to come back in too? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. And I think it's right that we would ask for the the. I think it's right that we should ask for the matrix, um, and I would agree with that. I suppose what I would suggest that it needs to be a little bit broader than the Department of the Economy, um, because this is obviously a a matrix which takes into account all of the the various different variables um, currently undefined, and knowing what those parameters are. Uh, is rightly what the business community, which this committee primarily is, is focused upon. Um, so I, I do think we need to get this not just from the Department of the Economy, but I, I would like to hear um, from the Executive Office speaking on behalf of the Executive as a whole to provide us with exactly the parameters uh, upon which uh, decisions are going to be taken. Um, because saying that it's based upon the data um, is one thing. It is that analysis of the data, uh, which in, then informs the decision making. Uh, and I raised this yesterday in the assembly that if it was based upon the data, uh, I do not understand why our schools are going to be the last to open on these islands when we are in a better place in comparison to the Republic of Ireland, for example, in terms of our vaccination program. So if, if the public are to have confidence in the analysis of this data, uh, we need to know exactly the parameters. And I haven't heard a defensible reason put forward from uh, others based upon the data why our schools are still not opening. Uh, and that is a, a litmus test um, uh, in terms of how other parties are going to be approaching this. So I think we need to get the matrix not just from the department, from the economy. Um, but we're going to need this uh, in terms of uh, exactly laying out what the framework is that the executive are going to be basing their decisions upon. And you know, I, I haven't heard that not just business organisations. I know um, from my own constituency, speaking to businesses um, in terms of their concerns from the document we published last night. And I think we as a committee uh, do need to take that on board um, and we need to try and get some information to help them to be better informed as to the, the business decisions that they need to be taking because those decisions have implications upon people's uh, jobs, their livelihoods, and that then has a consequence to all of the other concerns around their mental health, poverty, uh, women in particular, uh, young people in terms of the loss of earnings and so on. So I support getting the matrix, but I think we need to extend that to the executive office on behalf of uh, the executive as a whole to give us crystal clear guidance as to what the uh, parameters are for their decision making process. Okay, thank you everybody for those comments. And, and obviously it is laid out in the um, roadmap in terms of which um, data is being looked at and what the factors are under community and um, economic data and indicators as well. But Peter, I think that we can ask for some more detail around that. Chair, we write to um, TEO and we write to the Minister to seek the, the target and targets and matrices and clarifications that they uh, are working to. Um, we, we write and ask for those. Okay, then moving on to um, page 38 of table papers, there's correspondence from the Education Minister regarding the independent review of education, recruitment and revised terms of reference. The Minister made a statement to the Assembly on the 15th of December uh, regarding the terms of reference for the review which had been agreed in principle by the Executive. A revised terms of reference has now been agreed and published. The changes are limited and were designed to reflect the important linkages between the education and economy portfolios and provide the appointed panel with sufficient scope to consider relevant issues pertaining to further education, higher education and apprenticeships. So are members content to note? I think that's an important addition. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, page 40 of table papers, there is a response from the Department for Finance regarding financial support for Donaghadee Golf Club. 
Um, this advises that Mr Simpson's letter references the financial assistance, coronavirus number two regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and the phrase relevant businesses means a business or service which was restricted or subject to closure. It is important to note that the legislation defines the restricted hereditament uh, as a hereditament within which an occupier carries on a relevant business. An amateur sports club is not considered to be a business. It is normally a body that is not established or conducted for profit. And although this is not a rates-based scheme, sport and recreation, 80% of rates relief is only awarded to a club or society that is established on this basis. The Department for Communities has advised that details and funding opportunities, current and planned, continue to be updated regularly on Sport NI's website as the executive continues to provide financial support to these organisations during the current restrictions. So are members content that we forward this correspondence to the golf club? And if Gordon was here, he'd probably speak to it. But yeah. Um, Chair, we can, we can continue to follow up. As I say, I think that that's still um, an issue and a gap that the uh, executive ministers are looking at um, going forward with whatever new COVID funding becomes available and whatever plans they have in the new financial year. Yep, OK. Moving on then to page 42 of table papers. There's correspondence from the Department for Finance um, on the spring supplementary estimates. Um, so it's just for members to note. Um, moving on then, page 46 of table papers. There's correspondence from Domino's Pizza Group to the Health Minister and CMO. Domino's are concerned about the ongoing 11pm curfew on food delivery and the significant impact it's having on their business colleagues and customers. They advise that the North is the only reason, region which has imposed restrictions on food delivery. So we have already raised this specific issue with um, executive ministers, so are members uh, content to note? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sinead, and then Christopher. Yeah, I am tend to note that but uh, i think it, it has to be said that i welcome the fact that this um is this curfew is going to be lifted in stage two because i i, I just don't understand uh, the reasons behind it um and it's it's unnecessary go ahead christopher mark this day Sinead and i agree um i absolutely think that this is uh, an unnecessary uh, restriction I am presuming that the logic was, um, you know, if people are getting food delivered to their house, then it's going to encourage people from outside each other's bubbles to sort of congregate or what have you. That has not been the experience. That has not been what is happening. Uh, people are getting food delivered to their house and are staying in their house. And uh, I agree uh, that this is a restriction that needs to go. Um, now, it's, you know, it's clarified that it'll go in stage two, but this raises again the issue about when is that? Um, that's where, um, but no, I'm absolutely content to note, and please have it recorded in the minutes that uh, Sinead McLaughlin and I are on the same page, so that's uh, a rare letter day in the history of this committee, so <laughs> thank you. I'm absolutely delighted, Chris, and I'm not going to set the dog on you now. <laughs> okay. I suspect both of them pineapple on their pizza as well. <laughs> Moving on then to agenda item number six, which is the SL1, the Education, Student Fees and Support Amendment Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 34. There is the SL1 at page 35. Um, this statutory rule contains amendments to the Principal Student Support Regulations. Um, the Education Student Support Number Two Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2009, and the regulations which set out the persons and higher education courses eligible for home tuition fee charges. Um, the Students' Fees qualifi Qualifying Courses and Persons Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2007. Eligibility for home tuition fee charges and student financial support for courses here in the North, starting in the academic year 2021-22 will be removed for EU, other EEA and Swiss nationals who are not covered by the citizens' rights provisions of the withdrawal agreements. The amendments made by this instrument will mean, therefore, that such persons will receive the same treatment as other international students. <coughs> Excuse me. The rule will come into operation in late March. <coughs> the rule is subject to negative resolution. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Do I take a drink? Um, 
So, um, so members, we just had some concerns around this SL1 and we're seeking to get a briefing from the department before the committee proceeds um, as it is a significant policy change regarding EU, EEA and Swiss students. So are members content that we would do that? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number seven is the SL1 Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 42 and the SL1 at page 44 of table papers. This statutory rule amends regulations two and three of the Employment Rights Act 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay, Northern Ireland Regulations 2020, the Principal Regulations. This, regul or this legislation replicates a, a British strategy instrument, the Employment Rights Act 1996, Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations 2021, which were made on the 22nd of February 2021 and come into force on the 31st of March. The amendments to the Principal Regulations are necessary by the extension of the coronavirus job retention scheme until the 30th of April at that point. The principal regulations assumed when made on the 13th of August 2020 that the job retention scheme would end on the 31st of October. An initial amendment was introduced which reflected the extended end date of the uh, job retention scheme to the 31st of March and I assume we will see, receive another um, statutory rule at some point. The purpose of the statutory rule is to continue to provide greater certainty in the calculation of a week's pay and to ensure that furloughed employees do not lose out as regards certain statutory entitlements which relate to the termination of employment by having been furloughed if their employment is terminated while or shortly after they have been furloughed. The statutory rule does not affect any entitlements of employees who have not been furloughed. So the rule will come into effect on the day after it is made and it is subject to negative resolution. So this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. Um, obviously, we were previously supportive of this and very supportive of it. So are members content with the policy direction as outlined? Yep, thank you. Okay. So we're going to move now to item number 13, which is the SL1 Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment of relevant period in Schedule 8 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 241 of table papers and the SL1 at page 242. This statutory rule is to extend the relevant period during which Schedule 8 to the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, the CIG Act, will apply until the 30th of September. Schedule 8 makes temporary provision with respect to company moratoriums. In recent months, the committee has been advised of the making of a number of statutory rules which have been required to extend the period during which temporary provisions in the CIG Act are to apply, and this is another one of those statutory rules. The rule will come into operation on the 30, or sorry, before the 31st of March and is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure. This, again, is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy laid out in the SL1 as, as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the business office. So are members content with the policy direction as outlined? Thank you. Okay. So moving on then to item number eight, which is the Department's Economic Recovery Action Plan. There is a clerk's memo at page 51 of our PACs. There is the action plan itself at page 57. The department has published it, the action plan on the 24th of February with an emphasis on four key areas, supporting a highly skilled workforce, stimulating research and development, building a greener economy and promoting investment, trade and exports as the drivers to recovery. It also identifies the number of actions the department plans to take to stimulate growth and these include the development of a flexible skills fund, widening access to apprenticeships by removing the age cap, developing proposals to implement an artificial intelligence centre of excellence, delivering the high street stimulus scheme, delivering a tourism voucher scheme to stimulate demand, accelerating delivery of city and growth deals and developing a green innovation challenge fund. So the main themes from the committee's micro-inquiry into the local macroeconomic outlook, 
are well reflected in this action plan. Um, this is also the key for the energy micro inquiry and the skills micro inquiry. So are members content that we would seek a briefing on the plan from the department and also that we would seek stakeholders views on this um, action plan and that we will also write to the minister regarding the committee's views on support for the plan um, after we get the briefing on it and get the full detail. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number nine. There is a written briefing from the department on the petroleum research. There is a written briefing at page 89. Um, there are currently no petroleum licences in the north. There are two licence applications currently being considered by the department, um, which we are all well familiar with, one for Loch Ney and the other for Fermanagh. Um, on the 13th of October, a non-binding motion was carried by the Assembly calling for a moratorium on petroleum licensing in October also the department commissioned an independent consultancy called Hatch Regenerous to consider the policy context of the British government's climate commitments and petroleum policy elsewhere, for example in the south. The research will consider the potential impacts of oil and gas exploration for the north and the final report is due in April. The department will use the information gathered to consider options and develop evidence-based petroleum policy proposals. These options will be considered by the Economy Minister and will then be presented to the Executive for a final decision on the preferred option, which will then be subject to public consultation. No decision will be made until the research is concluded and the Executive has discussed the issue. So the update is to note at this point, unless members have any comments they wish to make. Okay. Thank you. I'm moving on. Go on ahead, Sinead. I know. Just uh, I'm, I'm ha happy to content or uh, to note now, but I do think that I suppose members will have very strong opinions in relation to all of this. But I suppose not now is not the time to air it until we get the report. No, it's, fair, it's a fair point, Sinead, and I suppose we we have previously um, expressed our views in relation to petroleum, the petroleum license applications, and I know the majority of members, and I think even the minister. Uh, referred to their views in respect of n not being supportive. So um, I think that we will wait and see what the outcome of that research is. So um, if members are content, then we'll move on to item number 10. Thank you. So page 94, there's correspondence from the clerk to the committee for the executive office. At its meeting on the 24th of February, the TEO committee received an oral briefing from the junior ministers um, on the latest events relating to the UK exit from the EU. The TEO committee would like to know if the economy committee has undertaken any scrutiny of the effectiveness of the um, NIO's business engagement forum. Um, so this is something obviously we've raised a number of times, um, including with the NIO and with others. So are members content that we would write to the TEO committee indicating that we have written to the NIO several times on this issue and have engaged with stakeholders on it and we can share their correspondence. Yeah, we absolutely. have received back on it also. Yeah, are members content? Thank you. Moving on then, page 95, there is a letter from the House of Lords EU Committee regarding the EU's proposals on the UK's domestic batteries framework covering both the North and Britain. Um, this is related to the common framework on resources and waste. Um, so it's to note at this stage, unless members have any comments. Okay, moving on, there's correspondence from St John's Ambulance at page 97. Um, due to staff being furloughed, it has been unable to submit its annual accounts to Companies House on time, and as a result, it's been threatened with removal of its registration from the register. So, are members content that we would write to the Minister to ask for assistance in ensuring that small limited companies and charities are given an extension to complete this task given the circumstances of the pandemic? Chair, sure, is absolutely uh, content and support that. I actually think it's outrageous that an organisation like St John's Ambulance should be threatened in this way. You know, I mean, this is a voluntary organisation, a charitable organisation that does excellent work throughout the community. And so it's, it's really important. This is just another example of one of these things that unintended consequences of, of the situation that we're in. And I think it's absolutely right that we should 
and not only uh, write about uh, this particular issue, but lend our support to charities um, who have been absolutely hammered, especially you think of places like Cancer Research or Oxfam, not able to open their shops, all right, to do some stuff online. So a huge source of income for those organisations. So, no, I think it's absolutely right that we should write on this issue um, specifically and also in a more general sense. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, moving on then to page 100, there is correspondence from Rani requesting a closed session briefing from the Renewable Energy Sector Supply Chain Fuel and Plant Installation and Servicing. So, I'm... Are members content that we would seek to arrange an informal meeting? Yes. Thank you. At page 101 then, there is a Commons Library briefing paper on the Turing scheme designed to replace Erasmus. Um, so just to highlight that the scheme will be backed by £110 million and will provide funding for around 35,000 participants in universities, colleges and schools to go on placements and exchanges across the world from September 2021. The announcement of the Turing scheme has been welcomed within the education sector, but there are concerns the decision not to fund inward flow will lead to a decrease in the number of students coming to the UK and the loss of the benefits that they bring. Are members content to note at this stage, and we might seek to get some further information around this? Chair, I, I think um, the, the Minister was still having discussions on potentially being able to access Erasmus, so it might be timely um, to seek an update on where all that sits. Yep, that would be useful. Chair, just on that point, Go if ahead. I may, just briefly, I know that the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee had a detailed brief on um, the replacement schemes uh, and um, the discussion, you know, it was very informative, but I, I feel like maybe as a committee we might benefit from an opportunity to question um, either the minister or some of the junior ministers about the proposals and the schemes. Just what, interested to see what other members feel, if that's something that we could pursue. I know we've asked other ministers to potentially present to the committee, and that hasn't, but they haven't been forthcoming to date. But this is quite a significant scheme for um, for students here in North Man. I would, I would agree with John there, Chair. Uh, I think it's really important that we can actually compare and contrast um, the schemes from the original Erasmus uh, schemes and this new scheme, uh, particularly on the funding aspect of it and the reciprocal nature of, of exchanging students. So I think it would be really, really good to get um, input here and it would also be really good to get actually a response from the Irish government exactly um, how they are supporting Northern students um, in, in relation to engagement with the, the wider Erasmus programme. So I think we need a bit of clarity around it because it seems to be getting very foggy uh, in relation to uh, who's supporting what. Chair, if, if we get clarification um, first from the department on the discussions they have and, and where they are with Erasmus and what their understanding of this touring scheme is, because it, it looks as though it's a UK government scheme and I'm not sure what input the executive has had. So if we establish just what that is at, at a first stage and then we can look at who we can bring in for briefing around it as well. Um, it just to be important to pin down who's responsible and what exact uh, input that the minister and the department have actually had. Okay. Okay, so moving on then to page 120, there's correspondence from CBI following its meeting on the 24th of February in relation to its COVID-19 emergency working group. Um, I had a meeting with CBI on Friday, and one of the things they flagged up, and it's in, and it's been in a number of their meeting notes, is in relation to rapid testing for workplaces. So I was wondering if we could, if members are content, write to the department and ask um, if they have any plans to support businesses in um, putting in place rapid testing in workplaces that you know will help obviously limit the um, the, the spread of the virus and, and help businesses to reopen. And, and stay reopened. Our members content, and maybe also Peter to the health minister. Yeah. Our members we content. Okay. Yeah. Right. Moving on then to page 122, uh, 27th report of the examiner of statutory rules. So as to note, unless members have any comments. Moving on then, page 51 of table papers. There is a memo from the clerk 
to the Committee for Finance regarding engagement with the banking sector. The Finance Committee is writing to determine um, whether the Committee's engagement with UK Finance and the, or to determine about our engagement with UK Finance and the local banks. The Committee for Finance requests that members of the Finance Committee are included in our planned informal meetings and or in a more formal joint concurrent meeting with the banking sector. If members are content, we will ask that Peter responds to the finance clerk to confirm that the committee has agreed a date for an informal meeting with UK Finance and the local banks and that the clerks discuss any inclusion of finance committee members at that meeting before a decision is made. Chair, can I come in here? Yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Um, uh, we're all very well aware of the announcement by Bank of Ireland um, this week to remove uh, 15 branches in Northern Ireland and over 103 uh, throughout the island. That is uh, going to have a real impact uh, on customers and also uh, employees, and I want to acknowledge that. But I think it's really important that this committee um, gets some formal briefings from the main banks yes, here in Northern Ireland. But I also think it's really important that we get the Financial um, Services Union in here because there are real issues in relation to uh, employment uh, 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 and uh, labour relations issues in relation to the employees as well. So, um, uh, and I just want to note uh, the regret uh, at these closures uh, yeah. at this time, particularly in the middle of a pandemic, when, when people are, are struggling at, at very best to get any type of services within their high streets. Uh, and now this is another main actor um, that is, is leaving our high streets for seemingly for good. Yeah, so we have that um, issue uh, as a specific item under AOB, so we can pick up on it then. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on then to 10.9. Um, there is correspondence from the Finance Committee forwarding a reply from the Economy Minister on the Presbyterian Mutual Society Sabres, so this is for the Committee's information. Moving on then, page 56, there's correspondence from the TU Committee to the Minister for the Economy regarding a briefing from NI Youth Forum on their report, Our Voices Speaking Truth to Power. The Committee has raised issues affecting young people who attend university over the past several months and reported the financial struggles that have arisen for them as a result of the pandemic, especially for those who have part-time jobs in the hospitality sector. So are members content that, that we note this and we can keep it with any other actions that we have? Okay, moving on then, page 57 of table papers, there's correspondence from the National Installation Association of Ireland propose, proposing an installation pilot project that will deliver um, improved energy efficiency to around 20,000 homes and creating in excess of 200 jobs. This obviously is an issue that the committee is familiar with. It has been raised as a theme in our three committee micro-inquiries. So are members content that we would seek a briefing? Yes, please. I think it's important um, at the minute. Energy efficiency is a key thing. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. Moving on then, page 59 is correspondence from the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds to the Finance Minister regarding their plan for a green recovery. Members may have seen that. I think it's been shared with us previously. Um, so it's to note unless members have any comments. Thank you. Moving on then, page 94, there is a report from Pivotal on education skills and training for young people aged 14 to 19. Um, obviously fits with some of our, our other work and, and our briefing that we've already had in respect of the 14 to 19 strategy. So that's to note unless members have comments. Okay, moving on, page 114, there's an invitation from NI Impact Forum on Adult Learning to a webinar on the 19th of March on creating a culture of lifelong learning. Obviously, there was a lot of interest in lifelong learning at our recent skills micro-inquiry, um, and I have been invited to speak at the event, so are members content that I would do that? Thank you. Okay. Moving on then at page 115 of Table Papers, there's correspondence from the Competition and Markets Authority on the creation of an office for the internal market. The office for the internal market will have a distinct remit within the CMA to provide technical advice to the British government and parliament and the devolved administrations and legislators on the smooth running of trade within the United Kingdom. The OIM, as it's called, will also monitor and report on the health of the UK internal market, uh, including trends and developments across sectors, nations and regions. So are members content to note? 
Thank you. Okay, moving on, page 117, there's correspondence from Northern Mutual Limited requesting to brief the committee. Um, the Northern Mutual Limited is a cooperative society that has been created for the purposes of establishing a mutual regional bank, um, one of which is owned by its customers and serves the needs of this region, retaining the wealth generated here and using it for our own benefit. So our members content that we would um, uh, have an informal meeting in the first instance. Yep, thank you. So then moving on, page 118 of table papers is the Southern Regional College's annual reports and accounts. The CNAG has indicated that he's content with the accounts, so are members content to note? Yes. Then page 236, there is the ISNI Assembly Committee report. Again, are members content to note? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So um, moving on then to item number 11, which is um, any other business. Um, members, as, as Sinead has already mentioned, this members will be very aware of the recent announcements um, this week in respect of Bank of Ireland about the closure of 103 branches across the country and 15 in the north, and also the recent announcement by Ulster Bank that it was pulling out of the market in the south, um, and that also impacts on 600 plus workers that are based in Belfast. So the committee has um, scheduled informal meetings with UK Finance and the local banks. Peter, what's the date for that? Do we know? We're looking at that after Easter now, Chair. So that'll be all of the local banks plus UK Finance. Um, we've been in discussions with them for quite some time on this, and we, we, we've now managed to get a pin down. So we will get a date to members um, at a time as soon as we have that pin down. Um, it's, it, it's an unusual situation. I don't think any committee has had access to all of the local banks and UK finance at the same time before. Thanks, Peter. Um, obviously, it, it is very concerning, both from the, the perspective of the, the workers in the banks, but also from the perspective of banks' customers and, and 15 branches um, that are spread across the whole of the north and will impact on many um, communities and many of our, our, our small and medium-sized towns across the north. And, and in a couple of those towns, um, the, the branch that is closing is actually the last bank in the town and obviously that has a, a real impact um, on customers, um, particularly older or more vulnerable customers who may not be um, familiar with using online banking, but it also has an impact on small businesses in, in those uh, communities um, and some of the things that have been highlighted to us, for example, are around the access to night safes. Mm -hmm. And so this is, these are some of the issues that we would really like to explore in more detail. Members may also be aware that the Financial Conduct Authority has, um, it has published guidance that there should be no closures of bank branches during the pandemic. Um, and I think that that is something that, that needs to be highlighted as well. Um, I think that it's absolutely, um, you know, it's absolutely not on that we would have bank branch, uh, bank branch closures during the, the course of the pandemic. Um, and the Financial Services Union have called for a moratorium on closures until the end of 2022. So I, I think that it would be um, prudent for us to seek that briefing that Sinead has requested from the Financial Services Union because they represent... Um, a lot of the, the workers in, in those branches um, that are impacted and would have a lot of um, knowledge and insight into to the, the situation regarding banking more generally. So if members are content, there's a, a number of actions that, that we would like uh, to propose that we would, first of all, write to UK Finance to ask that local banks act with caution and with due concern regarding the services that they offer our communities and to express the committee's concern that no actions should be taken precipitously during the COVID crisis. Um, are members content that we would do that in the first instance? Yes. Thank you. Then yeah. that we also write to the Financial Conduct Authority to clarify um, its stance on banks making decisions around bank closures and other significant changes during the pandemic. Um, and that we also would seek the views of um, a wide range of stakeholders about access to bank services going forward and to explore um, solutions for retaining services that banks provide. So our members content that we would do those um, four things. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Chair, this, this may well, and I, I'm just flagging it up now, this may well um, 
become a micro inquiry purely because there's a lot of ends that are going to come out of this that need to be tied together, particularly the idea of retaining community banking services and how that's done. So just to flag that up and put that into member, members' um, minds, just to have a think about that, but we'll, we'll go out with these initial actions and see what we get back. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, members of contempt will move on then. And just, uh, I suppose, before we, we do the final item, to, to recognise that this is Maeve Holly's last committee meeting. She has been on um, an interchange the comment to the committee from the Consumer Council. And I'm sure the committee would like to offer our appreciation and gratitude to Maeve for her work particularly her significant role in, um, in the administration of our micro-inquiries and that we wish her the very best in her new role. And we'd also like to welcome Jean Barkley um, to the committee. Jean is on an interchange to comment from Tourism NI and Jean is here in, uh, with us today in, in the committee. So welcome to Jean also. Thank you. So, then the final item then is um, our date, time and place of the next meeting and the committee will meet on Wednesday the 10th of March in room 29 and this will be one of our short meetings yeah. so we will have to be out sure, by we, 12. We, have, uh, we just have a single briefing. We have NETA in, um, the Tourism Association, sorry Alliance. Okay, so meetings adjourned. Thank you. This okay, is thank the you Northern Ireland Assembly, Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.